What do you think it feels like to be a hero? What does it take to be a hero? Is it being the good or compassionate? Or is it someone who foolishly follows orders from the higher ups? Well, no matter what it takes, in this story, a hero who once defeated a demon king dies due to traitors, and as a result, revenge is his only way to make them pay. This story begins in a kingdom called Kurs. A hero named Rahl, whom the people loved, has finally killed the demon king, who has brought terror to everyone. However, instead of being treated as an honorable hero, he's seen tied up as he is now about to get his punishment. Wondering why? Well, it turns out that the royal princess named Victoria of the Curse Kingdom has grown to despise Rahl for overtaking her popularity among people after defeating the Demon King. She did give him a choice to marry her, and he should be spared. However, Rahl declined the offer and is now subjected to execution. The people who once loved him have now turned against him all because of the power that the princess holds. As a result, on his last breaths, Rahl mutters and swears that he'll kill everyone in the same suffering that they have put him through. He promises to show them despair and agony on the day he comes back. The people around him then laugh it off. After all, how could a dead man possibly exact his revenge? Fast forward, Rahl now wakes up in the brightest white place he has ever been. There he meets the goddess of love, who seems interested in him as well. It seems like Rahl is a magnet for hot girls, huh? Rahl, knowing that he can easily manipulate the love goddess, asks her to resurrect him to exact his revenge. One year later, back at the Kurs kingdom, Princess Victoria is seen preparing for a wedding parade with Count Emil. Before the event even started, one of her commanding knights from the Royal Order of Chivalry, named Sandler, suggested that the event should be postponed in the meantime while they investigate some unsettling matters happening in the kingdom. It is said that for the past month, there was an unknown attack that killed all of the princess's front guards, which has been making everyone anxious for the princess's safety. To add to that, there have also been some reports of an unknown disease spreading throughout the kingdom. People who are infected with the said diseases mutter the word, Bless Her Highness the Princess, over and over again while they are delirious with a high fever. However, the princess couldn't care less for her people. Instead, she even went too far as to say that the order of chivalry and the people of the kingdom should be her shield, so her safety wouldn't be a matter of question. Little did she know, some awful things would happen to her a few hours from now. On the way to the grand event, the son of Princess Auclair, Count Emile Auclair, is seen with Princess Victoria in a carriage. However, instead of seeing a sparkle of love in Victoria's eyes, she's rather irritated by the stupidity of the Count. However, such things are what's making her interested in Emile. Aside from being good looking, which is a plus, being a stupid and foolish husband that will be easily manipulated is what really matters to Victoria. This way, she can ensure that the power over the whole kingdom is hers and hers alone, even if they have a child. As they reach their destination, cheers from the people echo throughout the whole plaza. When Emile and Victoria are stating their vows to each other, the sound of blood splattering stops the event. Then, as Victoria turns her head, her eyes widen as she sees Rawl all well and alive. Victoria can't seem to believe that Rawl is in front of her. After all, she had witnessed him die through her orders. Rawl then states that he has been resurrected from the depths of hell in order to get revenge on the people that betrayed him. But before he has reached this point, we must go back to the time he was in heaven. I mean, we can't possibly forget about the goddess of love who had sacrificed everything for Rawl, right? Rawl Evans had seen the goddess way back before he was even thrown into the world for the first time as a hero. The goddess of love seems to be so affectionate towards him that she is willing to do everything to make him hers. Even the time that Rawl requested for her to send him back to Earth for revenge as well as for her to give him back his powers. Although it was a grave sin according to the law of the gods, the goddess of love nonetheless did what Rawl requested, all because she was in love with him. Rawl used the soft spot of the goddess to get what he wanted, and so he did. It's now just a matter of time before we know what will happen next. As Rawl kissed the goddess as hard as anyone could imagine, the goddess tingled in happiness. As a result, she then gives what Rawl has requested. With a big smirk on his face, Rawl is now one step closer to fulfilling his plans. As he says it, it will be the beginning of a new legend for the kingdom's hero. Rawl is then reincarnated back to the nasty corrupt kingdom once again. There he is welcomed by the front guards. As he remembers how the front guards have slaughtered his men like animals with his powers, he ended their lives in a flash. Now this explains who killed the front guards in the case that the commander knight has been investigating. During this time, Rawl is able to hear about the princess's wedding parade. With an evil smile, he has now found the perfect place to exact his revenge on the royalty. It's been a month since Rawl has been reincarnated from the brink of death, and since he has been waiting for this day patiently, he can't wait any longer to see the agony and suffering on the princess's face. But before anything happens to the princess, whom they see as the messenger of God, the commander knight jumps right in to protect her. The commander somehow believes that Rawl is a demon that copied the appearance of the fallen hero. That said, to make the princess believe that it is indeed him, he moves closer to her with the most devilish look on his face. As the Order of Chivalry tries to stop him from doing any more harm to the princess, he cuts their heads off without even touching them. This made the whole plaza panic. When everyone rushes to escape in order to save their lives from the hands of Rawl, Rawl tells everyone to stay as he is about to show them a spectacular show worth watching involving the royal princess. People tried to flee, but it seemed like everyone was now under Rawl's power as their feet froze to the ground. 
They then start telling Raul that they are just ordinary people and have no affiliation with the princess. These statements made the princess angry to the point that she even asked the commander knight to slice off her legs just to save her. On the other hand, as Raul sees Emil already peeing himself in the corner because of fear, he uses his powers to move the count's body to hold the princess in place. And the next thing that happens shocks everyone, including me. Raul removes the princess's red dress as he thinks it wouldn't complement the color of blood as much as a white one. With the princess's bosom on full display, the men from the audience can't seem to control themselves from fantasizing about it. Of course, this made the princess very angry towards Raul. But that wasn't the main event yet. Raul then reveals that since the princess is so eager to have a baby whom she can control to take over the throne, Raul is doing her a favor by executing her plans as early as possible. However, the question is, is it Raul who will be the father of the future royalty? Hmm, makes me wonder. Now the answer to that, why don't we dive into the story more? While the princess mutters the words that no lowly individual can possibly touch her sacred body, the commander knight then tells Raul to face them honorably. This word brings a wave of unforgettable memories for Raul. Just about one year ago before Raul went on the quest to kill the demon king, he stayed in a village called Makale. There he was able to get closer to everyone from the old to the young. And since he'll be the future hero of everyone, almost everyone in the village is excited about his comeback after he kills the demon king. However, since Princess Victoria is a freaking devilish woman after Raul gained so much popularity and respect from the people, she orders her knights to kill and torture everyone in the said village, all for the sole purpose of getting Raul's reaction. Although the knights thought the princess's orders were unnecessary, they didn't really have any choice. After executing the villagers in the most horrible way possible, Raul was in deep shock as he saw the current state of his village. The moment that he set foot on the land, he was captured by the kingdom's knights immediately. Now back to the present, as this flashback starts rushing to Raul, the commander knight can't seem to compose herself as she tries to explain her side, stating that they didn't have any choice considering that the princess's orders must be followed no matter what. Raul then uses his magical powers to increase the volume of the commander's voice for the people to hear. At that moment, everyone in the plaza is now made aware of the awful things that the princess has done. It turns out that the princess made it look like Raul killed everyone in the village to make the people in favor of her. However, it seems like, as the old saying goes, the truth will always prevail. But all this drama isn't enough for Raul, so he controls the commander's body once more and uses it to punch the hell out of the beautiful face of Princess Victoria. Now, with all the bruises and swelling on the princess's face, no one could ever possibly recognize her anymore. But it doesn't stop there yet, since we're about to dive into the juiciest part. Just before the subjugation of the Demon King, one of the closest people to Raul, his sister with her unborn child and husband, bids him farewell as he goes on the mission. Little did Raul know that this would be the last time he would ever see his sister. To make things worse, it seems like Princess Victoria really wanted to irritate and emotionally torture Raul during this time that she even personally escorted Raul to the church, which is supposed to be the sacred home of God, now covered in blood. There, the scent of the church was reeking of blood and flowers. Flowers being what Raul correlated his loving sister with. Now for the finale that everyone is anticipating, the princess will now atone for the sin of killing Raul's sister. However, he can't just possibly kill Princess Victoria just like that. I mean, where's the fun, right? Raul suppresses his anger once more and in order to torture the princess in the worst way imaginable, he punches the princess like there is no tomorrow, causing the royalty to puke gallons of blood. As she stumbles to the ground, Emil on his back trembles in fear. Everyone is watching as the great princess suffers excruciating pain. For the majority, to escape such agony, some of us usually beg for our lives or plead sorry. However, that wasn't the case for the princess at all. Raul then tells her that she is just reaping what she has sowed, that this event is just retribution for her misdeeds and that he is just copying what she did to people. That said, as Raul already had much fun playing with the princess's ego and pride, he marks the day's performances to an end, unfreezing everyone from his magic. However, the princess doesn't even give up at all. She then orders the men in the crowd to kill Raul in an instant. One of the knights successfully pierced its sword to Raul, which made the princess very happy. But it seems like Raul is already immortal, as none of the swords were able to kill him. That said, he reminds the princess that he'll come back after the princess's recovery. It seems like there is a part 2 for this act. That said, while everything is already falling into place for Raul, he then decides to visit his old village to pay his sister's grave a visit. He lays some flowers on the church's hall where his sister died, and says he's sorry for visiting late. Then what looks like a hologram image of his sister pops up in the air. He then informs the said image that the priest who once sold her has now been killed and that he will make sure that everyone who has done wrong, not just to his sister, but to the innocent ones, will pay for their sins. Back at the castle, Princess Victoria is seen torturing the knight's commander to death. The princess can't seem to accept the fact that her people now have turned against her, and are currently seeing her as a curse, all because of the statements that the commander had stated in the plaza. However, the rage that the princess feels for the knight's commander is nowhere to be compared to how she feels towards Rol. That's why she orders her knights to immediately look for Rol and make sure to bring his head to her no matter what. A kingdom messenger is then seen rushing towards the woods as he tries to find the only one that everyone thinks could defeat Raul. 
However, before he can even reach his destination, he's bombarded by a bunch of goblins from all over the place. As he tries to fight them all back, a goblin king sneaks on his back. Caught off guard, the kingdom's messenger would almost die if it were not for a mysterious strong man who rushes in to help him. It turns out that the man who helped him is the same man he's looking for. He's said to be the greatest swordsman in the country. With that said, the second chapter, The Forbidden Carnival, has finally begun. Then we are taken to the swordsman's mansion. There it is seen that he is enjoying a meal with his lovely wife and two sons. Then a new servant asks the general what meal he would like to be served to the kingdom's messenger. Hearing such a question made the head servant panic, as he informed the general that the guy was a newbie. The general then tells the new servant that there is no need to think much of it since the messenger has immediately gone back to the kingdom. Or did he? As the general's family continues to eat their meal, another servant enters the room, delivering the main dish that the general has been eyeing to eat since earlier. With just the smell of the food, the general is easily captivated by the experience it will give. But the moment that he took a bite, his reaction was beyond imaginable, as the food gave off the taste of victory. In his head, he then says thank you to the messenger for his hard work. The next day, the general now is about to go to the capital to start looking for Rawl. As he says his farewells to his family, his children are giggling happily at the excitement that their father is about to kill another strong man. When their father was already out, the brothers started hunting, and for their age, they are rather aggressive and brutal. The brothers didn't think much of their surroundings as long as they killed their prey. However, it seems like the two have already grown bored of their hunting pet, but the thought that their father is about to bring them another pet to play with once he comes home made the brothers delighted on a devilish level. After they finally kill the animal pet they have been playing with, Rawl then comes into the scene asking them if he could join. However, it seems like Rawl isn't in the mood to play with them, so he ties them up really well as he overlooks his assigned task to the general servants digging the ground around the mansion. As they dug deeper and deeper, they were able to uncover some unsettling discoveries. Bones of dead people are scattered everywhere. It seems like the general has an addiction to eating human flesh. Even the poor kingdom messenger who thought he would be safe from the goblins got killed by the general instead. However, no matter how many times Rawl asks one of the servants to tell the truth about the general's evil doing, it seems like his mouth is completely shut, all for the sole reason that the general has been paying them a ton of money to cover up his nasty actions. While Rawl is busy trying to order the general's servants, the general's wife is seen lurking behind a building. She prepares her poisonous bow as she's about to use this to supposedly kill Rawl. However, the tables have turned for the general's wife as she's now the one who is killed by the use of Rawl's magical controlling powers. Meanwhile, somewhere in the forest, Rawl made this hologram type image of the messenger that the general has killed to send a hint to the general that something bad has been happening inside his mansion and family. And just like that, the general has finally reached the mansion only to be welcomed by his wife's naked dead body hanging on a tree with her guts out and about. This made the general as furious as anyone could imagine. The general then asks for his sons. Rawl then assures him that they are well and is even the one who did the magnificent masterpiece on their mother's body. As the general swings his sword continuously, Rawl just smirks it off like nothing. Then, Rawl asks the general if the image of his wife hanging on a tree like a butchered animal reminds him of something called the Baden Village, the hometown where Rawl grew up. In a flashback about many years ago, in the said village called Baden, Rawl with his sister and mother have been living their simple lives in the happiest way possible. Although their lives were not as lavish as others, they were a joyous family nonetheless. However, everything changed when what was supposed to be another happy day in the village turned gruesome and bloody. It is said that demons had attacked the village, according to the general at least to what he has said to little Rawl that time. To make it worse for Rawl and his sister, they saw their mother hanged in a tree like a butchered animal with her guts hanging out of her body. With the anger he felt inside seeing his mother brutally and disrespectfully killed, Rawl's inner power was awakened at that time, so the general took him to the capital to be trained and owned. However, as Rawl grew up, he realized that the people he trusted were actually the demons who killed the people in the village and his mother. It turns out that the general had killed Rawl's mother and eaten her like he used to with his other victims. Since Rawl remembers such events, the general tries to emotionally attack him in hopes that triggering his past trauma will catch him off guard. However, such things don't affect Rawl at all. In fact, the unbothered Rawl even made the general even more furious. As a result, the general rushed in to attack him once and for all. The general is now about to start the fight with Rawl. But before that, since he is so worried for his sons, Rawl assures him that they are well inside the dungeon of the state, and that the only way for him to save them is if he is able to defeat Rawl. With a very furious look on his face, the general didn't think twice as he attacked immediately. He even stated that after he had beaten Rawl into a pulp, he and his sons shall feast on Rawl's body. With that said, the general immediately attacks as soon as he can. When he thought that everything was going great for him, he ended up getting cornered by Rawl. This time, Rawl then executes his attacks like there is no tomorrow. And with just a few swings here and there, we can clearly see on the face of the general that he is struggling immensely. However, the general seems to be so hard-headed that with such a low percentile of even winning, he still tries to attack Rawl with all his might. Rawl even jokingly gave him time to attack, but it seems like the general is just too weak even to do so. That's why Rawl immediately jumps into the finale of the fight as he cuts the general's hands off without killing him. Rawl even tells him that a feast will indeed happen later on. 
The general and his two sons are then seen sitting on their dining table, nailed in place by the magic thrall. When the general is finally woken up from his sleep, he's in great shock seeing his sons act strangely. As he furiously asks Rawl what the hell he did with his sons, Rawl then explains to him that he just copied what the general has been doing. It turns out that Rawl has found a drug that the general's wife's family has been making. He found it in the cellar when he was planning to tie the boys up. Inside the estate's dungeon, countless individuals are seen struggling with the drug. As a result, Rawl can't possibly spoil the fun. After all, the general's wife has developed the drug so outrageous in so many ways. And the fact that his wife's family is also prestigiously known to be great healers throughout the nation, Rawl can't wait to pay them a visit soon. Hearing such statements made the general angry since he probably already knew what would happen to his in-laws if Rawl were to go there. However, if I were him, I'd focus on thinking about his safety first since Rawl is already at the end of chapter 2 and is about to start the third act. He then informs the general that the carnival first has now commenced, and the ingredients he prepared for the feast are two lambs and a bull. To ensure the freshness of the meat, Rawl will cut them on the spot. He starts off by cutting the general's shoulders and frying them off like a steak. Then he moved to the thighs, which were tender and juicy. Even if the general cries for help as the excruciating pain starts to linger throughout his body, his screams wouldn't be heard by anyone. And to make things worse for the general, Rawl is now about to make his sons eat their father's flesh. The general then pleads to let him go, even with just his eldest son, who is the heir in the family. But it seems like Rawl has already decided to make the general's life as miserable as it can get, and let him meet the same fate as what he did to Rawl's mother. That said, for the finale, Rawl ended up killing the whole family in an instant. Now that he has already done his mission at the killer's castle, he shall now go and play with his next prey, which is the general's wife's family. At the Altman Resort National Pharmaceutical Research Institute, Dr. Renee Beneke is seen experimenting on live people as she tries to see how much of the body a person can afford to lose before dying. After playing with her human guinea pig, she puts their organs on display as a souvenir of some sort. She even starts wondering what would happen if she replaced a human's brain with a monkey's. Such a psychopath. She didn't even stop there. Young kids aren't even safe around her since she also uses them as lab rats. Although the kid tries to plead for help, it seems like Renee is already blinded by darkness. In a little while, the military commander advisor, whose name is Lucas Eckhart, enters the scene to retrieve all the waste that Renee has piled up. The commander doesn't really care about whatever dark scheme Renee has up on her sleeves. For him, all that matters is the money that she'll pay him. On the other hand, the research institute supervisor, Lord Da Costa, then informs Renee that he wants to make a drug that will make soldiers immortal. This way, they won't be subjects that perish quickly from a painful fight. However, the problem is that immortals are hard to control, considering the power they hold. That's why Renee has thought of a plan to employ a drug that makes the soldiers destroy themselves after a set period of time. This way, they can still somehow control their human machines and raise the specimen strength and have them annihilate the enemy without them thinking much of the consequences after. That said, Renee immediately started with the experiments. The supervisor's son, Johannes, also started to gather as many soldiers as he could for the testing of the formula. But it seems like much of the formula doesn't work the same way as Renee and the supervisor have been wanting. As a result, they ended up looking for more guinea pigs they could play with. It even reached the point that they started bribing villagers and lying to them that they could live in the estate if they did one thing. But we all know they ended up getting killed by the hands of these demons. When it finally reaches the time that Renee is able to formulate the ideal drug they want, they start executing the plans immediately the next day. While on the other hand, Roll is now finally at the estate and is about to start his third chapter, which is playing with the Brave, a hide and seek that ends in death. With the news about Rawl spreading havoc throughout the kingdom and the fact that the Lord's daughter, the general's wife, has been killed on their estate made everyone in the research facility scared for their life. Johannes then suggests to his father that they should ask the military to come and help them since he doesn't really want to get killed like his little sister. Dr. Rene, however, ensures them that as long as they have the poison, Rawl couldn't possibly lay a finger on them. Lucas on the corner then speaks up about the warning letter that the royal capital has sent and with all the things that are happening inside the facility, everything in the letter sounds more realistic now than it was before. Lucas then mentions how Rawl wanted to exact revenge on the people he'll target. This made the eyes of the three widen as if a flashback of wrongful memory started to flood their heads. When Lucas asks if there is a reason for the hero to target them, Dr. Renee is quick to respond that there is not. However, Johanna slips, which now makes the situation worse. Lucas now thinks that there might be a justifiable reason behind the hero's actions, but Dr. Renee added that Rawl is just a mere traitor that has gone crazy. However, Lucas doesn't believe any of her statements. He then added that if they were true to him, he would not be able to protect them from harm. Knowing that Luke is the only one among the four who can fight in one-on-one -on -one combat with Rawl, the Lord then states their sin. It was all because of a drug that they had prescribed to the soldiers during the war. However, before they can even finish their conversation, a dead monster is climbing their windows. Of course, such a scene shocks them. During this time, Rawl then announces the game of hide and seek in which he wants the four to participate. Since the conversation earlier was cut short, Lucas then asks again if the soldiers that the Lord mentioned earlier are the hero's beloved men, his supply soldier comrades. The Lord then reasons that they simply prescribed performance enhancing drugs, but the side effect was so lethal that they ended up killing everyone in the group. 
That said, since that day, Rawl has never stopped thinking of the possible way he could kill the evil people who mercilessly killed his men. Lucas then asks them if the person is safe in the facility. As they remember that, they rush towards the safe room to look for it. However, it seemed like they were already late. Meanwhile, a while earlier, Rawl is seen on the first floor having quite a stroll in the hallway, trying to formulate how he will possibly execute his plans. He even took the general's bones with him and manipulated them to serve as his assistant. As a natural reaction, everyone on the ground floor was in a panic, considering the wanted deadly killer was now with them. To make them even tremble in fear, Rawl orders the general's bones to attack the researchers without completely killing them. It seems like Rawl has better plans for the researchers' bodies. He then gets the poison that he took from the safe room and makes every single researcher drink it. As a result, they ended up becoming the same monsters they had been experimenting with making. Now that Rawl has already executed his plans to turn everyone on the ground floor into this ugly looking weaponized human, it will be just a matter of time before the over 100 researchers on the ground floor self-destruct. That's why he will now move into the second phase of his plans. But before that, he makes sure to have fun while it lasts. He punches and kicks some of these low-life human monsters who see his beloved men as trash and unworthy of respect. They literally took a taste of their own medicine. With the rage he is feeling for his fallen men, Rawl makes sure to play with the corpses until the end. Turns out that Rawl has just recently looked into the wrongdoings of the other researchers while he was doing a preliminary inspection. The words that the researchers mutter about the fallen innocent soldiers whom they used as lab rats are just so irritating to hear. They don't have respect and dignity toward other people, which makes Rawl boil up in anger. That's why instead of killing just the general's wife's family, Rawl ended up ending everyone's lives inside the facility. After all, of all the 231 people inside the research lab, not a single one of them had a decent soul. A few minutes have already passed and the human monsters have now burst to their deaths, which made Rawl laugh in happiness as he witnessed the people behind the death of the innocent get killed by their own schemes. Rawl didn't anticipate that the people he thought were the ones that were good were actually the ones that would cause harm to the innocent. The enemy wasn't at the front lines, but within. Now that everyone is already taken care of on the ground floor, it's time for Rawl to head up to the top floor where even marvelous things will happen. It is then revealed that Rawl has been hearing all that the four have been talking about since earlier. He tries not to laugh his ass off with the funny things he hears them saying. However, he tries to compose himself to make the game more fun. As he explains the rules to everyone, Dr. Rene tries to escape the facility, but every exit point is now barricaded by dark magic. So there is no possible way they will be able to escape at all. Rawl continues by stating that going outside is futile. The hide and seek game is only applicable inside the research institute. Now it appears that no one cannot escape. The game has officially commenced. It's a matter of time before we know who will be the one to get found first. The Lord said that they should just stay inside the room and lock the doors until midnight since by that time, Rawl had already promised that he'd let them escape. Lucas, on the other hand, seems not to believe such promises, and the fact that they still have another 6 hours to go. The chances of them surviving is very slim if they'll just stay put. This is when Dr. Rene suggests that they should hide in a room that the hero doesn't know. However, before they even go there, Dr. Rene decides out of nowhere to make a coffee despite everything that is happening to them currently. It seems like Dr. Renee is planning a horrible scheme to kill the three so that her escape would be easy. However, Lucas has seen through her plans and that's why he asks her if they could exchange cups. Dr. Renee then reveals that the only two cups with the poison is the one that she gave to the Lord and Johannes. But something is revealed that will definitely shock you. It turns out that Rawl was disguising himself as Lucas this whole time. And for some reason, Dr. Renee is able to see through Rawl's identity, which makes Rawl quite amazed by how meticulous the doctor is. But it seems like Rawl is not yet done and still has things up his sleeves. Dr. Rene, on the other hand, thinks she has already won after exposing Rawl. Now that the Lord and Johannes have already drunk the poisonous coffee, it will be just a matter of time before they turn into monsters. But after quite some time, it seems like there is no transformation observed. Seeing how weirded out and confused Dr. Rene is, Rawl then finally reveals to her that the Lord and Johannes have been long dead since they were still inside the conference room. He was just using his magical powers to manipulate the flesh to make it look like they were still alive, when in fact, they were all dead long ago. This just leaves Dr. Rene the only one alive inside the facility. She then tries to explain to herself that she is just following orders from the Lord. However, Rawl already heard such excuses from the Lord himself, and that's why such reasons will not get accepted anymore. The thoughts that she is the only survivor that Rawl is playing with is so scary. That said, as she trembles in fear now, she tries to escape as soon as possible. However, Rawl is able to grasp her on time and tie her to place. He then takes her back to the ground floor where all of the other researchers were massacred. Rawl states to her that before she undergoes her beloved experiment, she must first witness his masterpieces. As Dr. Renee opens her eyes, she is in shock and disgust to find herself in a sea of dead bodies. However, that wasn't enough for Rawl, so he even played with her more by making her swim on the remains of her research till she reached the door to the underground laboratory. As they reach the ground floor, the trauma in the face of Dr. Renee is indescribable. However, it seems like Rawl can't simply comprehend how with just a small number of dead bodies made the doctor shocked. 
when in fact, she was the one who's behind the horrible human weapon making plan. Even though she has killed dozens of people in her laboratory alone, making horizontal slices out of a crying and screaming girl's body, starting from her feet, and transplanting a monkey's brain into a children's head, Dr. Renee has the audacity even to act as if she is traumatized. After she was treated humans as laboratory animals, she doesn't have the right to even get scared at this point because she herself is a demon. But it seems like Dr. Renee is persistent in acting as if she is innocent or what. That's why Raul, who has had enough of her, makes her remember all the nasty things she has done to people by showing her the images of the past. Dr. Renee then starts to reason that the village where Raul's men were assigned was the one that should be punished, considering they were the ones who didn't help the soldiers from dying. It turns out that once a monster drinks water, they'll technically turn back to humans, but since the village didn't help or even lend a hand, Raul's men burst to their debts. Raul then states to Dr. Renee that she doesn't need to worry since he is also planning to exact his revenge on the said village. But before that, he will first torture her. He makes her drink as much poison as she can and leaves her to suffer in pain, but he did give her a chance to make an antidote with her current state to see what a genius doctor like her concocts. And for some reason, Dr. Renee is such a prodigy that she is able to make an antidote for herself right off the bat. Even with the excruciating pain she is in, she tries to compose herself since she doesn't want to die anytime soon. After a few dips and mixes of her potions, he is able to make an antidote for herself. This of course made her so happy. Little did she know that this would not be the end of her suffering. Raul then informs her that she will be subjected to part 2 of the experiment. The smile on Dr. Renee's face quickly fades away since she thought that after making the antidote, she'd already be free. But it turns out that Raul couldn't possibly allow her to leave the facility alive. As a human experiment, Dr. Renee is subjected to be tested under different concentrations and testing samples throughout the procedure. From a few vials, she ended up drinking 13, 21, 41, and more. She still had the choice to make an antidote for herself, but seemed like her body couldn't take it any longer. She tried to beg for her life, but Rawl only stated to her that it was such a shame that the dead couldn't hear her apology. Her skin now looks crispy looking, akin to a burnt animal. She tried her best to stay alive till the end, but it seemed like her best wasn't enough. It took her 17 hours and 31 minutes to get killed. But with that said, Dr. Renee's death concludes the revenge story about the crazed doctor who doesn't think or care about people's well-being at all. Now Rawl is off to the next thing on the list. He's now on the way to the other demons who have sinned. It's just a matter of time before we know whom he targets next. This episode starts off in an innocent looking village called Nor. Two girls, who are sisters, got lost in the woods, so they are trying to find someone who can help them go home. One of the villagers decided to help the poor girls with such delight. The man brought the girls to their home and fed them like they were some real visitors. The man even suggested that the girls should just stay for the night since it was going to be quite dangerous if they stayed out and about in the woods. Both girls were so happy that there were people who were still willing to help them wholeheartedly. Little did the poor girls know that in the next few hours, they would regret their decision to stay in the innocent looking village. While they're in their deep sleep, the girls are awakened by the hard choking of the villagers, who looks at them as if they are a good catch of fish. It turns out that the village is actually performing this dark scheme every time a traveler passes through. They start stealing every valuable thing each traveler has as this is their only way of living. But since the girls were only children, they ended up with such a small haul. That's why they decided to cut the girls hair and sell it as a wig. This way they'll still be able to get a large sum of money. After shaving the girls hair and getting what they wanted, the villagers immediately killed the two and buried them somewhere back in the forest. When they thought that this marked another day for them, the villagers ended up getting haunted by one of the girls dead bodies as it knocked on the village gate once more, looking for its big sister. As a natural reaction, the gatekeepers were shocked to see the same girl they'd buried earlier alive and kicking. In fact, she is much stronger now than she was before. However, it turns out that it is all Rawls doing. The villager didn't recognize him at first, but when he finally introduced himself, everyone was shocked to know that the most wanted man in the whole kingdom was in their village now. The villagers then start asking why the former hero would be in a place like their village. Rawl then bluntly asks if they still remember that one year ago, a strange monster appeared around the village. But it seems like the villagers are trying to deny such claims. That's why Rawl decided to remind them of what happened on that same day. Before the Demon King was defeated, a number of demon monsters had been bringing terror to people, especially in the slums. One day, many children were killed in a rural area in the kingdom due to two demons who heartlessly and brutally tortured them for fun. One group of children is ready to face their deaths when one of the demons decides to play with them first. He gets one of the children and lifts it up, stating that the kid's friends should look at how he will torture the poor kid. Without even thinking twice, the demon ended up removing the kid's eyeballs like it was nothing. Thankfully, before things got out of control, Rawl is able to come into the scene to save the leftover survivors. Rawl then asks some of his comrades to help the other kids as well by providing them with first aid. However, it seems like the kids are still a bit angry at the fact that a hero like Rawl is late in saving them. Maybe if Rawl got there earlier, many people might have still been alive. The kids wish that if they had the same power and strength as Rawl, they would pour all their might to ensure that everyone is safe and alive. Crying their hearts out for the loss of their friends, the kids think that they are weak and will always be. 
However, Rawl tries to comfort them by saying that he used to be like them as well. His mother got killed by nasty monsters alongside his whole village, and that experience is what made him who he is today. He added that to become stronger, they should make sure to be dedicated each and every day. To make it even more memorable for the kids, Rawl also handed one of them his dagger, which had been with him through his battles. This way, the children will stay dedicated and motivated to protect everyone. A few months have passed by since Rawl saved the children from the slums. They are now well and happy as they are about to become brave soldiers in the future. But before they start with their first ever big journey as junior cadets, it is seen that Johannes from the previous episode starts distributing the fatal drug to the poor kids. And since they are just children who are naive of the true harsh color of the world, they end up obeying what Johannes has told them. As a result, in an instant, they ended up transforming into that monster's form. With much agony and pain, the children tried to look for help in neighboring villages, one of them being Nor. They tried their best to assure the people of the village that they'll harm nobody. However, it seems like the villagers were not technically scared of that. When the children ask for water they can drink so they can transform back into their human form, the villagers just laugh them off, stating they should pay any amount of money before anything else. With all the water resources they have inside the village, the villagers still opted not to help because of their greed. As a result, the innocent children who had dreams of protecting everyone in the kingdom burst into their deaths. And what makes things far more gruesome is that the villagers even had the audacity to steal from the dead. They even got the dagger that Rawl had given one of the children. That said, with all of their crimes exposed, the villagers now one by one try to state their own reasons. Most of them stated that they were just following the chief's order. However, Rawl doesn't accept such an explanation. After all, no matter how they plead, no single soul can ever escape the crimes they have committed. Since Rawl thinks that actions speak louder than words, he uses his magic controlling powers to make the villagers follow him on a super exciting field trip that the villagers will not forget. Below the scorching sun, Rawl makes the villagers walk mile after mile. Rawl plans to make the villagers walk as far as they can until they reach Moltke village. That's why when they saw the entrance to the said village, the villagers were very happy. As they rush towards the village entrance, they are bombarded with disappointment as they find themselves back in their village. Some of them already know that Rawl might have been using magic to trick them. Walking for long hours below the sun makes the villagers so thirsty. I mean, who wouldn't? But no matter how thirsty they are, they haven't reached their goal yet. And as a result, they will once again go through another breathless journey to the Moltke village. Rawl even tries to provoke everyone by drinking a refreshing bottle of water. The villagers chief even begs Rawl for one cup of water. However, Rawl has already turned heartless toward evil people like them. It is said that the destination for the field trip is the mining village of Moltke which is near Nor village. However, in this fun field trip, they will always be sent back to the starting location the moment they see the goal. The scenery that the villagers have been seeing is something that Rawl made with illusion magic. But in reality, the villagers have just been going in circles around Nor village. It's technically a field trip with never ending suffering. One of the villagers then begs Rawl just to let the kids go, even if just the kids. One villager then starts stating that making a kid suffer like this is just heartless. Rawl is then quick to respond that if it's a game of who's more heartless or not, the villagers have already won. That said, Rawl then erased the kids from the picture by melting their bodies one by one. The villagers were obviously in shock and despair as they saw their children die. However, little did they know that Rawl couldn't do such horrible things to an innocent child. In fact, the real children are still in the village but are confined by the barrier spell Rawl has made to ensure they'll not leave. On the other hand, the kids that Rawl melted in front of the grown-ass villagers were just illusions. Then finally, the whole group reached Moltke village. Now some things are about to happen that everyone didn't anticipate. The front guards in the Moltke village are in shock as they see a group of people coming their way. They first thought that they were monsters, but as the Nor villagers came closer, they were able to see the clear picture of how pitiful the villagers looked now. They are dying to drink a drop of water to the point that they'll almost bring the whole gate down. They start begging for water again and again. And since the Moltke villagers are far more generous and kind-hearted compared to the ones in the Nor, Rawl decides to reveal the evil schemes of the Nor villagers by acting as one of them. Rawl then shows the ribbon that one of the Nor villagers got from the two girls they had killed earlier. And as a turn of events, the two girls are actually the daughters of one of the Moltke villagers. The Nor villagers try to reason out they did not commit all the said crimes. However, it seems like everything that Rawl has said coincides with the missing and killing events happening in the area. As a result, instead of helping them, the Moltke villagers decided not to as the crimes of the Nor must be paid. In the end, the Nor villagers were able to meet the same fate as their victims before. Then, there's a flashback showing how the Count and his son Johannes got killed by Rawl back in the research facility. It turns out that Rawl notified the father and son of his coming. Although they have prepared much for Rawl's arrival, considering they know they wouldn't stay alive much longer once Rawl gets their hands on him. However, it seems like even if they hire as many soldiers as they can against Rawl, it is still impossible to defeat such a strong man like Rawl, who has now become immortal and far more skillful than he was before. That's why when the time Rawl is about to annihilate the father and son in tandem, as most humans would do with their devilish nature, Johannes tries to betray his father by asking Rawl to spare him, and his father does the same. This scene just made Rawl laugh. However, for Rawl, their sins can no longer be redeemed, and we already know what happened next. 
Back to the present, it seems like the Nor village chief is hard to kill. He hasn't given up yet and is still begging for water to drink, even if most of the villagers are now dead behind him. With such a desperate look on his face, the chief tries to beg Rawl for water to drink. However, to taste his own medicine, Rawl asks the chief for money in exchange for water, the same way he did with Rawl's beloved comrades before. That said, as Rawl walks away without even giving him a drop of water, the chief ends up dying. Back at Nor Village, the kids are wondering when their parents will be coming back, but Rawl informs them that no parents will be coming back to take care of them. Rawl is then shocked by the way the children act as if they were already taught how to kill and steal from people to make ends meet. That's why, instead of wasting such talent in killing, Rawl decided to make the children soldiers. He uses his powers to control them into entering a military camp near the village. At least this way, the kids will still have a place to stay and a purpose in life. Now that his mission in killing the despicable people of the village is done, he will now move on to his next phase, or should I say move back, as he is now going to execute the part of his revenge act on the princess. However, this time around, he will have another protagonist in the story, and it's none other than Sandra, the commander of knights that Princess Victoria has tortured immensely. Rawl rushes to the kingdom's palace and kills every soldier he encounters to take Sandra out of the dungeon. Sandra will now be the next leading actress in his act in the fifth chapter he titled Love is Never Without Jealousy. After hearing about the disappearance of Sandra, the princess is obviously irritated by everything. She's so angry at the thought that her men are so incompetent. She can't seem to comprehend that Sandra is able to escape the prison in her current state, and even having the guards killed doesn't add up to everything. Then she started to realize that maybe it was another scheme arranged by Rawl himself, knowing that her face had now recovered from the massive injury it got last time. This makes the princess anxious about what's going to happen next. As a result, she makes everyone in the palace look for Sandra as soon as possible. Meanwhile, a few hours ago inside the dungeon, Rawl is seen talking to Sandra. However, it seems like Sandra already went cray cray as she starts muttering words about the princess again and again. Somehow, such behavior entertains Rawl very much. He then disguises himself as the princess and tries to deceive Sandra into believing that the princess has already forgiven her and is now entrusting her to perform another task. With much happiness on her face, Sandra immediately states that she is willing to do anything for the princess. As she looks back to her past for the sake of the princess, she even killed her brothers, even if not ordered to show her loyalty. That's why she can also do the same now, as long as she could continue to serve the princess. This made Rawl happy as his new act is now falling into the right place. He then healed Sandra and gave her all her armor and swords. Sandra then obeys whatever Rawl is ordering as she truly thought it was all the princess's orders. She starts creating terror inside the palace as she slices off every single servant and soldier who comes her way. Now blood and many guts are scattered on the palace's floors. The real Princess Victoria is still irritated at the fact that her men haven't found Sandra yet. Little did she know that Sandra was already creating havoc on the other side of the palace. Then it just took a few moments before Sandra barged into the princess's throne carrying an amputated head. The princess is in shock to see how bloody and gross Sandra is. Sandra then hands over the head towards the princess, stating that this is her offering as the princess requested. The princess then tells her men to stop Sandra immediately, all at once. Sandra then tells the princess that she has already killed the king's aides, as the princess has requested. And this made the princess confused since she didn't ask for such orders. The statement made the princess caught off guard as the people around her started to mutter accusations towards her. On the other hand, Sandra is still looking so happy, thinking that this is all the princess has desired. However, the princess doesn't think the same. Princess Victoria is so irritated that she aims to strike her whip at Sandra once more. However, she ends up whipping herself due to the magical barrier that Rawl has inflicted on Sandra. Furious, the princess has now decided to revoke Sandra from her position as a knight. Despite all this happening, the princess has found a silver lining in it. She thinks that as long as she is the one that can kill Rawl, she will become the first queen of Kurs without a man. People will look at her as a hero and will obey her the way she wants, but little did she know Rawl has more tricks up his sleeves. It's the day of Sandra's public punishment. The princess decided to have one since it would serve as a warning to those who want to oppose her that this is the fate of the traitors. Princess Victoria tries to blame Sandra for all the sins that she has committed in hopes that she'll get the trust of the people back. As the princess slowly gets what she wants, people now turn against Sandra and start throwing things at her. Seeing how the people are in a rage, the princess is so happy as she thinks her plans are falling into the right places. Many of the people start screaming that Sandra should die. She's a killer and an abuser. Sandra tried to explain to herself that everything she had done as a knight was for the people, for protecting everyone. However, it seems like the people of the Kurs kingdom are as evil as the princess. They just started laughing off and torturing Sandra even more instead of listening to her. To make it worse, the princess also orders the other knights to throw Sandra into the crowd. Since they can't really execute her due to the protective barrier Rawl inflicted on her, the princess just decides to let Sandra's weak body get feasted on by lustful men in the crowd. As Sandra screams because of the harassment she is going through, other women in the crowd just stand and watch as men touch her body as if she is a mere toy. The princess just laughs devilishly, watching how the men drool on Sandra. Then out of nowhere, Rawl comes into the scene, now marking the start of another exciting act. For some reason, the princess doesn't seem to be in fear at all. 
Rawl, on the other hand, seems to see how nostalgic it is to see men purging on Sandra, the same way it was the last time with Princess Victoria. Rawl just laughs at the way that the people are acting, as if they are the most virtuous people in the world. That said, as Rawl is already in the mood to start his act, he starts off by introducing the new main actors and actresses in this chapter. He starts by announcing to the people the new full lineup of traitors he wants to include in the grand event. These are Archmage Wendell, Saint Christiana, Dame Sandra, and of course, Princess Victoria. He starts off with a backstory about Archmage Wendell. Wendell was Rawl's comrade, whom he thought of as his own brother. However, during the time that Rawl's sister and the people in the village are killed, Wendell reveals that he is one of the traitors who want nothing from Rawl other than the power he had at that time. Wendell honestly stated to Rawl that he never thought of him as a comrade or a brother. Rawl was just a mere imbecile to Wendell. Wendell was also closely affiliated with the attacks that killed many of Rawl's loved ones. That said, back in the present, Wendell tries to tell people about Rawl's killings these past few days to try to make the people choose which side is indeed in the wrong. Wendell also started to lecture Rawl about what's right to what's wrong. Like the audacity. Gosh. Rawl on the other hand almost laughs at the fact that Wendell can't even say these words to him personally and just sends an illusion. Hearing this made the princess shocked since she herself wasn't aware that Wendell had just sent an illusion of himself. However, Rawl is not yet done introducing his main cast. Rawl is now about to introduce Saint Christiana, whom he picked as one of the traitors in his past life. However, Christiana is quick to respond that she isn't a traitor in the same way that Rawl thinks. Although the saint didn't directly harm Rawl in any form, she was still the one who instigated the princess. For a saint, Christiana was a rather perverted one as she tried to talk many dirty thoughts to the princess about Rawl. It turns out that the princess has some lustful thoughts about Rawl that she doesn't want anyone to know except Christiana. And these fetishes started when the saint started inflecting thoughts on the princess that the lord wanted Rawl and the princess to be united, since this was the only way the princess could have Rawl. Such comments somehow made the princess interested in speaking with the saint. Since Rawl is saving many people, it's up to the princess to release his masculine desire and make him fall for her. In doing so, Rawl will no longer be able to live without the princess. At that point, Princess Victoria has already landed her fetish towards the hero, and she will not stop until she makes him hers. The saint then suggested that the princess should look into the people that were involved with Rawl and find out who they were. This may be the reason why the princess ends up killing Rawl's sister and the people in the village, in hopes that Rawl will give much of his attention to her. Now that the fetishes of the princess have been exposed to the people, she can't seem to act properly now. She is somehow embarrassed and irritated at the same time. The princess tries to hide the embarrassment she is feeling by stating that she is angry at the fact that Rawl and the saint have been spitting lie after lie. That's why with much desperation to save her name, she tells Rawl that she has finally found a way to end him. Since Rawl is known to possess dark magic, the princess has been researching day and night for its weaknesses. She was then able to find out that Rawl's black magic weakness was none other than holy magic. There are only a few individuals in the kingdom that are able to possess such power. Fortunately for the princess, there is one in the cursed kingdom that possesses holy magic. Saint Christiana is one of the few who have unmatchable skills and power, and holy magic is only one of the skills she possesses, which is considered to be her cleansing power. Light magic is the only power capable of purifying dark magic. That's why when the princess learned about such a thing, she was so delighted that a saint was on her side. Since she is so certain that the saint will be able to kill Rawl, she even announces to the people that she'll protect them and that the curse on the castle will end that day. However, when she orders the saint to kill Rawl with her powers, she's in deep shock as the saint refuses to do so, and obviously, the princess becomes furious at what the saint has been uttering. The saint then is quick to explain that she cannot obey the princess's orders, as stated by the king. The saint then further stated that the king had instructed in the letter he had sent to leave Princess Victoria to die since she was always an eyesore. The princess can't seem to believe what she just heard. She has this mixture of emotions painted on her face. I mean, what do we expect? Even her own father wants to dispose of her. That's why Rawl suggests that the saint shows the princess the proof so that she stops babbling nonsense already. As the saint takes out the letter that the king has sent, it seems like the princess's world shattered to pieces as she sees that the crest on the letter marks everything that the saint said was true. Hearing and seeing how the princess reacts, the people in the audience start murmuring in disbelief that the king himself has already given up on his child. The princess, on the other hand, can't control her anger anymore. It's as if she wants to cry, but at the same time, she's so furious that tears don't come down her eyes anymore. After reading the letter where her father states that he's willing to sacrifice her for the people literally made her blood boil. The king is willing to use the life of the princess to appease the hero's anger. Instead of ending up as a dual incompetent girl, the king promises the princess that she'll have a meaningful death. With much rage in her, she starts to order her knights to capture Rawl and the saint. However, it seems like the knights need to obey the king's orders above the princess's. Now that no one is on the princess's side, even her soldiers have turned their back on her. The stress kind of transforms her fresh look into this beast-like human one. Rawl can't contain his laughter as the crowd also starts to say their hatred towards the princess, knowing that the brat has no more power over them. However, the princess can't seem to tell the truth. She keeps on insisting that she is the only child of the king and the rightful heir to the throne. She's considered to be the gem of the kingdom, so no one would be able to replace her. But that ambition comes crashing down when Rawl informs her that the king already has three more children from his concubines. 
It seems like the king also has no trust in his daughter, and he even needs to resort to a secret plan just to make sure that Princess Victoria doesn't take over the kingdom. Hearing all this is the turning point for the princess. She now looks like a lone wolf in the woods, and Roald just can't seem to stop laughing at how pitiful the princess is now. The most beautiful face in the entire kingdom of Kurz looks like a filthy beast now. The crowd starts saying harsh words towards the princess, stating that she is worthless now, and that they are simply obeying her against their will since she's the daughter of the king. Now that everyone looks at her as if she's nobody, there's still one person in the kingdom that is still loyal to her. It's none other than the knight's commander, Sandra. Even though her body is now so weak, Sandra tries to climb into the stage and joins the princess in her toughest times. However, it seems like the princess doesn't want her to come closer, but the love that Sandra has for the princess is beyond imagination, and it's painful to see how she has sacrificed a lot for the brat. Sandra wants to rescue her from her suffering. However, it seems like the princess doesn't want to be rescued. While they're on stage, Sandra, for the first time, has finally confessed her love for the princess. Since Rawl still has control over Sandra, Sandra unexpectedly stabs the princess, but not in a lethal way. This is then followed by the slashing of Sandra's neck. In the end, both of the protagonists have made quite a spectacular show for the people to see. Since Rawl can't possibly allow Princess Victoria to die just like that, he drags her to a place where he keeps all the dead bodies of the people he has taken revenge on. This place is so sacred to Rawl that it now serves as his sanctuary. He then crucified her beneath the moonlit night, to torture her and make her suffer the same way she made innocent ones suffer for her fun. Rawl gathered as many wild animals as he could. As the animals rushed towards the princess's body, they start feasting on her flesh like there was no tomorrow. They eat slowly and thoroughly, which makes her suffer even more. Wolves are now devouring her flesh and the ravens gouge her eyes. But despite such pain, she won't die, as she will suffer lasting agony. On the other hand, as Rawl wanders his eyes on his collection, he sees that there's still more space where he can add people that he plans to take revenge on. Now it's just a matter of time before we know who his next target is. One month later, in the enslaved demon internment camp, Archmage Wendell and a man that looks like Rawl are seen with the man who is in charge of the demon enslavement. The man that looks like Rawl seems to be frustrated at Wendell for some reason, and we'll know the answer as to why later on. Meanwhile, at an arena in the Kingdom of Kurs, the real Rawl is seen chilling while he watches what seems to be a fight. With that said, the sixth chapter has now finally started, entitled The Enslaved Demon Rebellion. In the country of Kurs, the castle of Auerbach, the king has called for Rawl himself. With a big smile on his face, Rawl enters the palace happily and is ready to meet the big boss of the country. It seems like the king would just like to ask Rawl if he enjoyed the show he was watching a while ago. It turns out that it was actually an execution banquet for the thousands of former heroes who have burned villages with General Brown. The king is hoping that the lives of the useless objects can at least entertain him, but it seems like Rawl wasn't entertained at all, so he opted to take the liberty of teaching them a real show. That's why the whole banquet was a bloody mess. People started killing each other and even some executed people against whom they had no grudge. However, Rawl thinks that the people of the country itself are crazy enough even to reach that point. But the king thinks that Rawl is far crazier than anyone, so Rawl asks how the king concluded so. The king then states that the evil of committing unimaginable cruelties is something only Rawl is able to do. The king also opened up about the rumor that someone pretending to be a hero is hunting demons near the frontier. This made Rawl somehow interested, knowing that he was at the capital the whole day. There was no possible way that he could be in two places at the same time. The king then informs Rawl that the said imposter really looks a lot like Rawl. Then one of the ministers of the king suggested that it was still too early to conclude that the man was actually an imposter. However, after stating his opinions, Rawl kills him unexpectedly. The king then somehow remains silent about the rude behavior of Rawl, and instead even states that the minister is wrong. This made the king's servant shocked. The king then moves right back into the conversation about the imposter. He informs Rawl that the imposter is working with Archmage Wendell, whom Rawl has treated as a close comrade before, and some man named Cameron Allingham. The king wants Rawl to teach the two a lesson since they have been selling demon slaves all they want. Rawl then agrees, considering the fact that he already had a grudge against Wendell. That said, Rawl immediately traveled to the land of Kurz, territory of the demons of Hollerback. At the detention camp, the Rawl lookalike is seen with Cameron Allingham, who's the head of the facility. Many demon kids are seen getting assaulted again and again until they can't even move an inch. Seeing how battered the kids are, the fake Rawl seems not to take any of it anymore, so he starts vomiting from all the nasty things he has witnessed. While he is inside the bathroom, he is in shock as he sees the real Rawl observing him in the back. Seeing the real Rawl in front of him makes him tremble in fear. The fake Rawl somehow felt the intense aura that Rawl has been giving. After all, Rawl is now considered to be one of the most dangerous and feared individuals in the kingdom. Rawl, on the other hand, is amazed at how the imitator is able to imitate him in every single possible way imaginable. Now that the imitator knows that if he doesn't plead now, he might die later, he bows his head to the ground and says he's sorry again and again. The fake Rawl states that all he wanted to do was earn as much money as possible. That's why he used Rawl's appearance to get closer to Wendell and Allingham to land a good paying job. Crying his eyes out, the fake Rawl even went so far that he even licked Rawl's shoes just to show how sorry he was. Amazed by the behavior that the man showed, 
Roll informs the imposter that he knows it wasn't all because of money. This immediately makes the imposter stop crying. Roll then states that they should have a proper conversation over some black tea. After they both sit down, Roll then suggests that they should be properly introduced to one another. However, before the imposter can even speak first, Roll already states the imposter's name, which turns out to be a woman. Ada Taylor is in shock as to how Roll is able to know so much about her, especially her name. Roll then went on to explain that he did his own investigation, and it all ended up with her. There are only a few people in the area that have the ability to copy appearances, and based on the digging that Roll did, Ada is the only person with such magic that can possibly be related to Wendell and Allingham in any form. It turns out that Ada's family got killed by the people that work in the said demon trafficking business. That's why Roll concluded that Ada may have wanted to get his attention so that he could help her exact her revenge on Wendell and Allingham. With a dark smirk on his face, Roll tries to persuade Ada to call forth her desire for revenge, which is something she has always been wanting since the beginning. Hearing these words, Ada started thinking in her mind that ever since that day, she had kept having nightmares while awake. Nightmares that will persist forever until she kills those two. A few years back, Ada's father, who is a veteran trader and works as Allingham's accountant, was able to observe something strange in the way that Allingham had been acting one night. From his observations, he saw that Allingham was carrying something to the cellar. Since he has grown suspicious of the actions that Allingham has been taking recently, he can't contain his curiosity anymore. Ada's father ends up going to the said cellar to check things out for himself. As he opens the nightmarish door, he's shocked to discover that there's a secret room inside the cellar. As he peeps through the small opening at the door, he's speechless as he witnesses a group of demon children held captive inside. But what makes things worse is that as Ada's father tries to observe more, he's disgusted by what Allingham has done to the kids. Allingham started doing some malicious things to them that were beyond imaginable. In the end, as Ada's father tries to check on the kids' well-being, he's in despair as he sees the tortured looks of the demon children in the hands of Allingham. Although he tried to save some of them, he was too late as the majority suffered many injuries that no doctor could ever cure. That's why Ada's father decided to take actions and report the happenings inside Allingham's residence to the capital. Before he left, he even said goodbye and gave kisses to Ada. However, little did he know it would be the last time he would see his family. The next day, Ada and her family are able to receive a package where the dead body of their father is packed, with a saying that states traitors would be executed. Her plethora of memories with her father were all painted over by the recollection of that day. That's why she tries to avenge her father no matter what. But it seems like Ada doesn't have the courage and strength to do so. So Rawl tries to convince her and motivate her that revenge will not make someone go mad. Rawl made himself a perfect example. He only took revenge on the people who had done wrong to his family and the people he loved. And seeing the people who made you suffer, suffering is the best feeling ever. That's why Rawl tries to convince Ada to join hands with him and avenge those people Ada loves. Since Rawl also wanted to kill Wendell and Allingham, joining forces would make things easier for both of them. Without anything to lose, Ada accepts Rawl's offer. However, it seems like Ada is still weak and doesn't have any guts to fight anyone, as she sees herself as a weak one. That's why Rawl let her use his body as a medium for their revenge. Ada is taken aback by her sudden soul diving into Rawl's body, but Rawl assures her that he will make sure to guide her along the way. It seems like Rawl wants Ada to be the one in control of the revenge. That's why he'll let her borrow his skills and strength at the moment. That said, as everything is already in place, Ada and Rawl, who share one body at the moment, will now start executing their most wanted revenge, especially for Ada. As they reach the cellar, a group of guards is seen punching and kicking any demon child they can grab. It seems like they just do this to pleasure themselves. Ada, who is inside Rawl's body, seems to hesitate in fighting the guards since the only one she is after is Allingham and Wendell. Rawl then tried to tell her that the guards were also part of the whole evil doing. That's why they must be killed as well. That said, Ada now rushes towards the enemies, killing them one by one with all her might. She makes sure that she uses every inch of Rawl's power to make sure no enemies stay alive. With the strength of Rawl, she uses it to punch and kick the big guards. She also used some of the magical powers Rawl has. When they finally defeated all of the guards, the demon slaves were somehow in disbelief that they were all saved by the same man that works for Allingham. That's why Rawl tells Ada that she should explain everything to the demon slaves so that they can grasp the situation. However, it seems like Ada's statement doesn't really get through to the demon slaves, and as a result, Rawl ends up subbing in to talk. With all his flowering and encouraging words about freedom, he promises the slaves that he will kill Allingham together with his allies and make sure that the freedom the demons deserve is given. With such a motivational and heartfelt speech, Rawl easily got the hearts of the demons, and now they see Rawl as their savior. Some even volunteered to help him in killing the mean guys. As the demon slaves chant the words kill them, for Rawl, this is the most beautiful music to his ears. At this point, Ada realizes that she has taken the hand of an unfathomable man. Her eyes are now full of radiance, and for someone who doesn't like the spilling of blood or killing people, not of her interest, Ada has now transformed into someone that doesn't even feel any pinch of guilt from taking the lives of villains. She's now finally indulged in the justice of protecting the lives of the weak. Seeing how eager Otto was to exact her revenge made Rawl remember his past self. With that said, as the eagerness and rage in everyone started to build up, Rawl, together with Otto and the demon slaves, were now on their way to regain their stolen dignity, freedom, and revenge. 
the punishment for the fiendish humans is now about to commence. The act of revenge stirs the heart of any living being. The cheers and the rage that everyone is making are like music to Rawl's ears. Now that the pleasant chorus is about to be heard, Rawl is excited about knowing what's going to happen next. As they all march from the estate dungeon up to the ground floor, they reach a wide and big wooden door. On the other side of the door is Allingham and Wendell. In any minute now, everyone will witness a spectacular show, as what Rawl stated. As the door creaks open, Allingham and Wendell are seen waiting for Rawl and the others' arrival. Wendell is quite amazed at the fact that Rawl has reached this far after freeing the slaves. It seems like there's no hint of worry seen in Allingham and Wendell's faces. But one thing is for sure, they wouldn't be like this after a while. Ada, whose soul is inside Rawl's body, has taken control of the event for now. Ada announces to the two villains that they will now meet their death, since everyone is about to kill them both altogether. However, instead of getting scared by Ada's statement, Allingham and Wendell seem too at ease given the situation. It turns out that Wendell thinks the role that is in front of him right now is an imposter. That's why Wendell is so confident that he'll be able to kill it that easily. But a brief magical attack made by Rawl somehow shocked Wendell. Wendell knows that an imposter Rawl couldn't possibly have such magical powers. At this point, his assumptions were quickly demolished after Rawl states for himself that he is the real deal. This made Wendell surprised and still in disbelief. Rawl then states to him that he is quite sure Wendell is aware of the fact that he is out and about, exacting revenge on everyone that did him dirty. This means Wendell, among all people, should know best who is Rawl's next target, and that is none other than Wendell himself. In an emotional backstory of a certain country boy who had become a hero and had met a confidant that he would have wholeheartedly trust, the heartbreaking flashback of the betrayal of Wendell is shown once again. While little Rawl is in the palace doing his best in training in order to become the strongest hero that would help the kingdom, Wendell, on the other hand, is seen paying some kids to bully Rawl. Wendell would then act as if he wants to help Rawl by acting to sway away the so-called bullies he has hired himself. During their initial meeting, Wendell has already decided that he wants to become friends with Rawl since he knows Rawl will serve as a stepping stone in conquering the whole kingdom. As their friendship grows, Wendell and Rawl become the leaders of their generation. However, little did Rawl know that he was the only one that had pure intentions with Wendell. As they both embark on a long journey together as comrades, they grow up and are formally ordered to subjugate the Demon King. There was even a time when Rawl invited Wendell to visit their village and meet his sister. At that time, Rawl's sister had the purest intentions there could be. However, it seems like with the evil nature of Wendell, even though how much kindness Rawl shows and gives Wendell, it seems like Wendell's evil vision to conquer the whole kingdom has overly clouded his mind. Even with the fact that Rawl's sister even asks Wendell to take care of her little brother, without forgetting to remind Wendell to also take care of himself, Wendell still manages to think of nasty things to do with Rawl's sister when they get back. That's why, even though Wendell knows how excited Rawl is to meet his sister's baby and is happy at the fact that their family is growing, Wendell still manages to betray Rawl in the most hurtful way imagined. Rawl, on the other hand, has never doubted his friendship with Wendell back in those days. After all, he couldn't think of any reason to think that Wendell would betray him. Rawl honestly thought that Wendell is a one-of-a-kind confidant to him. That's why Wendell's betrayal was really heartbreaking for Rawl. On the day after they have successfully subjugated the Demon King, everyone in the kingdom, especially the Makale village where Rawl grew up, is happy after hearing the news. However, things are about to get bloody for the people in the village as a group of Kingdom Knights has decided to pay them a visit. Since Rawl has split up with the soldiers that have been with him during the subjugation, the princess at that time continuously sends him letters. However, since Rawl refuses to respond to the princess's letters, Bakale village has paid the price instead. Everyone in the village was killed mercilessly. When Rawl had finally arrived, he is in deep shock as he sees pools of blood and dead people scattered everywhere. On the other hand, Wendell is seen happy and amazed by how distressed and helpless Rawl looks now. Knight Commander Sandra immediately ordered the other knights to capture Rawl in an instant. Rawl didn't resist following Sandra's orders. Sandra then states that Rawl is now subjected to imprisonment for ignoring the princess's summons. Other than that, Sandra also informs Rawl that his arrest, together with his men, is due to the deaths of the people in the village, which the knights put all the blame on Rawl. Wendell, who is such a great actor, acts as if he is also in stress with everything that is happening, considering the princess made it look like Wendell will also get arrested. Little did Rawl know that Wendell was also one of the people behind the killings in the village. Rawl then explains that he wouldn't do such a thing to his people. In fact, he even suggests to Sandra that he'll look for the culprit himself. However, Sandra doesn't even listen to a word he says. She even orders him to surrender his sword or else two kids from the village will get killed. Rawl then immediately hands over his sword, but what happened next made Rawl furious. Even after surrendering his weapon, Sandra still killed the children anyways. At this point, Rawl is now worried about Wendell's safety. That's why when the knights start to take him back to the palace, Rawl whispers to Wendell that he'll come back and save him no matter what. Little did Rawl know that Wendell had been betraying him all this time. Many tragedies awaited Rawl after he was brought to the royal capital. He was sentenced for the crime of massacring the villagers, forced to gaze at his sister's corpse, and imprisoned inside the dungeon, all while being violated by the princess every day. At this point, with so much abuse that he has gone through at the hands of the princess, the royal highness still has the audacity to ask Rawl to become her manservant. 
However, no matter how much pain he goes through, Rawl maintains to follow his principles and declines the princess's offer. Even with bruises and wounds everywhere, Rawl never fails to think of his comrades, Christiana and Wendell's well-being. Little did he know that while he was suffering, Wendell was living his life inside the palace surrounded by servants, food, and women. Wendell is enjoying the life of elegance when he remembers to finally visit Rawl and witness the great hero's face being ruined. Wendell can't seem to stop laughing at the fact that Rawl has welcomed him with sparkly eyes as he proposed for Rawl to become the princess's manservant for their sake, Rawl's comrades. He finds it pitiful that Rawl still hasn't realized that he has been deceived this whole time. That's why on the time that Rawl finally finds out about Wendell's betrayal, together with how the priest and the princess's decree had violated his sister, he can't seem to internalize how the person he trusted the most and treated as his own family would do such a thing to him and his sister. To provoke Rawl even more, Wendell even went on to say that Rawl's sister was such dirt as she swallowed several pistons at once. Rawl's poor sister was thrust back and forth by different men for days. But what made Wendell even more amazed is the fact that the princess is so tactless that she even orders to kill Rawl's sister since she felt this would actually hurt Rawl. It turns out that Wendell is also the one that told the princess about the church. As tears continuously pour out of Rawl's eyes, the rage inside his heart also intensifies. Rawl tries to remove his chains, however it seems like the princess made sure he wouldn't since the chains used to restrain him are specialized chains known to be indestructible that are only used for demons. With all that they have been through, Rawl can't seem to understand how a man like Wendell could possibly harm him and his family, knowing how much he trusts him. It reaches a point where Rawl even asks Wendell if he despises him so much that he can tolerate such crimes. Wendell then tries to explain to him that he is just a mere stepping stone that will allow him to reach the summit. Wendell honestly stated that this is the only reason why he has wanted to get closer to Rawl since the beginning. For Wendell, the most important thing in the world is wealth, influence, and fame. He strongly believes that with Rawl by his side, he will reign at the summit of the kingdom. That's why when Wendell sets his eyes on Rawl for the first time, he knew that he must successfully manipulate Rawl into subjugating the Demon King and becoming the hero of the land. This way, he'll be able to obtain fame. However, after the Demon King is defeated, Rawl is now Wendell's main problem. Fortunately for Wendell, the princess has offered him to do a job that pays well that also works in his favor. When he finally decided to make use of that plan, he never expected that Rawl would actually fall for the trap. Now, since Rawl is already out of the way, at that time, Wendell still requires more money, and the merchant Allingham would be the one that would help him acquire that much. This is the first time that Rawl learns about Allingham's slave business. It is also revealed that Wendell is the one that told the princess about Rawl's execution. With that said, back to the present, Wendell has been given the privilege to seat the front row as the revenge game starts. Rawl has made a replica of the Royal Coliseum with hundreds of spectators inside. Wendell, on the other hand, can't hide his amazement at how the power of dark magic works. Rawl happily welcomes everyone inside his magically generated Coliseum. He tells everyone to enjoy the spectacle to their heart's content. With that said, Rawl immediately begins the revenge show, with everyone cheering loudly. The main character for the show will be Allingham, who has done a lot of nasty things to the demon slaves. Hearing his name made Mr. Allingham terrified, as he already knew what was instilled in him at that moment. Mr. Allingham tries to call for help. He even states that he will pay as much money as anyone would want in exchange for helping him. However, since technically everyone in the Coliseum is Mr. Allingham's victim, it's already apparent that he'll definitely get tortured extremely. Hearing how Mr. Allingham begs made Roll remember the time that the priest who violated his sister also begged for his life, and we all know that didn't end up well, considering Roll has tortured him by burning them all to ashes. However, Roll made it clear that he wouldn't directly harm Mr. Allingham since the merchant didn't harm Roll himself. This is based on the principle that Roll follows, the eye for an eye. That's why instead of himself, he will entrust the revenge to Ada, whose soul is currently inside his body. Other than that, since everyone inside the Coliseum, except for Wendell, are demon slaves who've gathered in hopes of getting revenge on Mr. Allingham, Rawl will allow them to relish in Allingham's suffering up close. With that said, Ada has now started to move, aiming for an attack on the merchant. Mr. Allingham then screams for help, specifically to Wendell, who has turned his back on him like he always does. Now that Wendell has also betrayed him, Mr. Allingham has no choice but to suffer such painful revenge. Rawl then calls on the demon slaves who have been tortured, molested, and harassed by the perverted merchant. Some of them want to gouge the man's eyes and drown his eye sockets in alcohol. Some suggested that Mr. Allingham would be stripped naked and drenched with hot water until his whole body turns crimson red, while some simply want to beat him endlessly until he is covered in bruises. With all these punishments in mind, Rawl guides Ada by making her chant a spell that will create numerous torturing devices. Using this device, each and every demon slave gets a chance to make sure Mr. Allingham gets what he deserves. However, scrubbing his body with torn brushes ain't enough for the victims. Since he had castrated the majority of the male demon slaves he captured, the slaves have also decided to do the same thing to him. As everyone chants their excitement in making Mr. Allingham's life even more miserable, Rawl decides to create another torture device that will make Mr. Allingham's castration experience even more painful. Considering the perverted merchant has defiled and killed countless demons, it is already natural that the victims made his death even more painful. But before that, his dirty pistol should be cleaned first. As Mr. Allingham's balls get cut off, everyone inside the Coliseum cheers in happiness. 
Afterward, Allingham's former slaves continuously exacted their revenge on him one after the other. As planned earlier, his eyeballs were gouged, his skin burned by heated metal, and his limbs severed. Rawl, who had been observing Ada's improvement in her revenge skills, can't seem to contain his amazement at how splendid Ada has become in such a short time. However, the revenge show hasn't stopped there yet. Now it's time for Rawl to exact his revenge on Wendell. When Rawl asks him if he enjoyed the show, Wendell is quick to respond that it was such an extremely interesting farce. Now that it is all over, Wendell is planning to take his leave and go on to do his thing. Rawl then responds to him, asking what he's talking about. Rawl then tells him that he is the next protagonist in the show, so there's no way he can leave the Coliseum anytime soon. This statement made Wendell shocked as he clearly remembers the then hero Rawl has always abided by the rule an eye for an eye. But it seems like Wendell's world is shattered to pieces when Rawl states how naive Wendell could be, thinking that he's the same hero as he was before. Rawl then questions him if he honestly thinks that the person standing right in front of him is the same hero he knew before. Rawl doesn't deny the fact that if he was the same person as he was before, it's certain that he'll probably abide by the rule earnestly. However, since that hero has been long gone, Wendell should expect to go through the same torture and agony as the innocent people they mercilessly involved in their evil acts. Hearing this makes Wendell terrified. As a result, he immediately escapes the magical Coliseum using his own Archmage magic. As Wendell reaches the outside, he himself can't seem to believe that Rawl has grown so much from being such a crybaby to someone so fearless. However, Wendell is confident that his magical powers are far more advanced and honed than those of Rawl. Now that Allingham is dead, Wendell is planning to hassle some nobles and restart the business. He wouldn't really have such a hard time considering he got plenty of pawns. But before thinking of that, he must first need to find a way to deal with Rawl's dark magic. As he starts to think about his plans, he's in deep shock when Rawl pops out in one of the bushes, not allowing him to escape. That said, Wendell is taken back to the Magical Coliseum in an instant. As they enter the Magical Coliseum, Wendell is confused as he wanders his eyes. He notices a number of noble faces. That's when Rawl explained that since this show would be starred by Wendell the Great Mage, having some of the people that look up to him watch the show would be fun. That said, on the other side of the Coliseum are the demon slaves, while the other side accommodates the nobles. Now that everyone is paying attention to him, Wendell couldn't possibly show how terrified he was at that moment, knowing that if he did show any weaknesses, his pride as a powerful mage would meet his downfall. As the fight happens between the insane Revenger's dark magic and the Archmage's white magic, everyone is closely anticipating to see which one will reign supreme. Wendell made the initial attack, and as his flame trick engulfed the whole of Rawl, Wendell honestly thought that he had already won, as Rawl showed no signs of movement. However, as Rawl shows himself with no scratch whatsoever, everyone in the audience gasps in both excitement and shock as the fight continues to intensify. When it was Rawl's turn to attack, he made sure to suck up all of Wendell's mana as much as he could, leaving Wendell with no bolts to fight. This made the nobles in the audience wonder if Wendell is indeed strong, as many stated. Some even try to convince themselves that Wendell must have been hiding his true power in order to trick Rawl into thinking he is weak. Hearing this made Wendell fake a smile, trying to hide the embarrassment he was feeling inside as he knew that none of the nobles' words were true. On the other side, this statement made Rawl think of something fun to do as well. Since the nobles really wanted to see the so-called true powers of Wendell, if there are any, Rawl has decided to help Wendell unleash it. Rawl first takes the first step by stripping Wendell's clothes, then provoking his rage even more. However, no matter how hard Wendell tries, his strengths are just no match for Rawl. That said, since Wendell is already stripped naked, it's now time for the great Archmage to have a scrub-a-dub-dub -dub time. Most of the audience still looks pity on him, worrying about his well-being. This made Rawl question that despite being such an absolute scumbag, Wendell is quite the popular one. That's why with this much attention, especially from girls, Rawl decided to make Wendell's life even more miserable by telling everyone that Wendell supposedly openly laid a hand on any woman they met during their journey for the Demon King subjugation. But this fact is already known to everyone, especially with Wendell's popularity among girls. Such things are inevitable from happening. That's why Rawl decided to formulate an exaggerated story. He told everyone that Wendell kills women that he impregnates. As everyone knows, Allingham sells demons, and he's doing so with the help of Wendell, who has been secretly running a demon slave employment agency. Wendell, with the woman he frolicked with and impregnated, would tell nobles that he would take good care of the slaves in his estate. However, in the end, Wendell would just ultimately hand them over to Allingham. Women who were pregnant with the Archmage's child were all presented as toys for nobles and then later disposed of. Hearing this made the demon slaves remember that there was a time when human corpses would get disposed of as well. Now that explains everything. Hearing this made Wendell shocked. The nobles, on the other hand, have also taken their leave, as they see that Wendell is quite the inconceivable archmage whom they don't want to get associated with anymore. Seeing this made Wendell furious and frustrated as his people were slowly leaving him to die one by one. The demons then started chanting that Rawl should castrate him, which Rawl did as well. Wendell tries to cast his magic, however, nothing comes out. At this point, he is already dead meat. As Wendell fizzles, Rawl can't seem to control his laughter seeing how the great archmage is slowly losing everything. That said, Rawl is about to start the long-awaited snipping time. However, instead of diving right into the exciting part, Rawl prepared a challenge first. The challenge is quite simple. 
If Wendell raises his head out of the bucket filled with hair, entrails, and bodily fluids for 3 seconds, the instigator will snip off his thing with the scissors. As Wendell's head drowned inside the bucket that smelled so bad, Wendell couldn't contain it anymore so he raises his head within just a few seconds. Since Wendell barely avoided the consequences, Rawl had no choice but to make him suffer even more. When Rawl finally snipped off Wendell's weenie, the poor Mark Mage couldn't control the pain for himself anymore. Due to intense bleeding, Wendell ended up dying, only to find himself alive again with one death count on the screen. Wendell was confused about everything. He was so certain that he died the moment Rawl snipped off his things. The shock on his face is indescribable. Rawl then asks him how death feels while showing a book called Death Records. It seems like Rawl plans to make Wendell suffer by killing him again and again until he is satisfied. The first one on the long list of deaths is the avant-garde water fountain that Wendell Weenies made. Now, Rawl is off to do the second act. In this one in particular, some special guests are invited. The priests from the church that Wendell was beeping on while Rawl's sister was violated are now coming into the scene. They will be the special guests for this act. Just seeing them made Wendell terrified, already knowing what would happen to him next. Wendell tries to resist, however, Rawl tells him not to be afraid, as he will make sure to torment Wendell thoroughly after all. Rawl then pushes Wendell into the priests, who violate him in the worst and sickening way possible. On the other hand, Rawl is seen as fascinated by the scenario. He also explains that he just wanted to make Wendell experience the pain that his big sister felt. Wendell tries to beg, shouting to make everything stop. However, his screams just entertained Rawl even more as he observed him from the back. Wendell screams and screams as he is getting thrust to the point that he starts spitting blood. The torturing device is inserted inside his butt until it penetrates through his mouth. The torment he is feeling right now is unimaginable. With that said, the end of his second death comes to an end. However, it doesn't stop there, as Rawl still plans to make him suffer even more. Rawl then finally tells Wendell that the pain he is suffering and the death he is experiencing are all visions being shown to him with illusion magic. But Wendell would disagree, stating that there is no way possible that there could be visions that made someone feel real pain. No advanced illusion magic could ever pull off such an act. However, Rawl states that such a thing is just a piece of cake for Rawl. With that said, Rawl would want to enjoy Wendell's eternal death. On the other hand, it seems like Ada can't see such illusions as she notices Wendell has been acting strange all by himself for a while now. Rawl then shows her the Book of Death. He also explains that Wendell is currently dying over and over under the illusion magic he has cast. Hearing such a thing made Ada shocked since she herself doesn't believe that showing illusions inside of an illusion is possible. Rawl further explains that it takes time to show someone illusions over and over in the real world after all. Ada is quick to notice that there is one more page popping up now, marking Wendell's third death count. Rawl also informs Wendell that since they have fought the Demon King before, Rawl has decided to give Wendell a chance to break out of the illusion after every 1000 deaths. As the page keeps on increasing, Wendell honestly believes that he has already managed to escape from Rawl's illusion magic. However, Rawl on the other hand just smirked at Wendell's claims. Wendell looks so desperate at this point, he honestly thought that he was able to trick Rawl and has now escaped the torment even if he didn't reach his 1000 deaths yet. Meanwhile, Ada is quick to inform Rawl that he should cast the spell once again if Wendell's claims are true. However, it turns out that Rawl just gave Wendell the illusion of being able to escape. Everything was obviously a lie for him to be able to break out once in every 1000 deaths. Rawl technically tricked Wendell to the point that it fascinated him in a way. Seeing how cruel Rawl is, Ada starts to wonder for herself that she also imagined Wendell considering the possibility of Rawl not following the rules as well. But up until now, Rawl has been abiding by an eye for an eye as his rule dictates. Using experience of revenge up until now to deceive Wendell while still adhering to the rule of an eye for an eye, this made Ada question what kind of person Rawl really is. Rawl explains that he knows how weak Wendell's mind is. That's why he thought that if Wendell became senseless after his mind turned to mushroom dying too much, the revenge show would already be boring. That's why for giving Wendell hope for escape, he won't be able to despair. For someone who has deceived Rawl since he was a child, he wants to make Wendell suffer as long as possible. It reaches a point where Wendell already reaches 74, 75, 281 and more death counts. Wendell begs for Rawl to stop. However, Rawl seems to enjoy how tormented Wendell is right now. Ada is also shocked as she sees the incredible number of deaths Wendell has gone through. She can't seem to believe that the Great Archmage is completely powerless against Rawl, so she wonders how she could possibly defeat such a man like Rawl with her current power. 2,643 deaths. At this point, Wendell should have escaped by now, but it seems like Rawl has more plans for him which Wendell is not looking forward to. Rawl even decided to show Wendell an illusion of their initial meeting when they were still little. Rawl made Wendell go through the same feeling he felt with the bullies Wendell himself had paid that time. Rawl tries to enact the same scenario of how their supposedly friendship started, but this time Rawl is not taking Wendell's hand to be friends with him, but instead to make him his torment toy. As Wendell's body and mind are completely out of shape now, Rawl has concluded that this round of revenge is already complete. When Rawl decides to take Wendell away, many of the audience start shouting that they also want to take their revenge on Wendell as well. However, Rawl is quick to turn them down, stating that all Wendell has ever done was protect Allingham, which means he has no business with the demons anymore. The demons have also realized that what Rawl said is true in some ways. What's more important to them now is the fact that they have been freed. 
Otto then questions Rawl about whether managing to free the enslaved was more important to him than pulling off his revenge. Rawl then immediately answers that it was, but he cannot deny the fact that he is also satisfied that they've got the revenge too. Now then, with that said, with Rawl's dark magic, everyone is taken back to the detention facility. Rawl tells the demons to do as they wish since all of them are now free to go. He and Ada have also gone their way here. There, Ada's soul goes back into her body. However, instead of showing her appreciation, it seems like Ada is furious at Rawl. Rawl then asks her if they've gone back to being enemies. Ada is then quick to respond that she's never considered Rawl as her comrade. At this point, Rawl then reveals how he already knew that Ada had been holding his hand with such hatred. Ada admits that she felt nothing but disgrace during that time, but now that they have fulfilled their goal of freeing the demons, there's nothing to stop her from getting her revenge. Not on anyone but the great hero Rawl. Rawl then says something that makes Ada shocked. It seems like Ada is not just an ordinary village girl. It turns out that she used to be a pure untainted evil. All this time, Ada thought Rawl didn't take notice of her true identity. Ada is still a naive girl on the inside, but if they strip away her village form, taking off her double-layered imitation magic, her true form will show. That said, without any more reason to hide, Ada stated that ever since the instant that Rawl appeared before her eyes, she's always wanted to vent her hatred towards him in her true power. As Ada's wings open up and her form changes, the true person behind the mask has now been revealed. It turns out that Ada is the younger sister of the Demon King that Rawl has murdered, and she is here right now to avenge her older sister. Ada's real name is Theodora, and Rawl already knows of her existence since then. Rawl says how glad he is that they have finally met. He also added how Theodora looks just like the ruler of the demons. Theodora is quite amazed at the fact that Rawl has already investigated her name well. Rawl explains that preparations are crucial for revenge after all. In that case, Theodora asks him if Rawl must have known the reason why she's appeared before him, which is simply to get revenge for her older sister. As Theodora aims and swings her weapon at Rawl, Rawl is quite astonished by the rather large swing that she made. He then reminded her of what he had taught her about fighting, that keeping movement to a minimum, drawing a line to follow her head, and then taking action is a must. However, instead of listening to Rawl, Theodora continues to attack him like there's no tomorrow. When she already had a grasp on him, she stabbed his neck over and over until a pool of blood started to pour out. But it turns out that it wasn't Rawl she was stabbing, but it was Wendell. Rawl, however, ensures to cast magic at Wendell to make him immortal, since he is still planning to decorate his museum with him. Theodora doesn't let her guard down. She then makes a surprise attack on Rawl, but instead she ends up getting restrained herself. As she can't move her entire body, she tries to ask Rawl to let her go. Meanwhile, Rawl seems so fascinated by looking at how she struggles to escape. Rawl then tells her that if she wants to exact revenge on him, she must first suppress her emotions and use her head more. Rawl can't seem to contain his amazement at the fact that Theodora really thought she could manage to defeat him with just a stiletto. For Rawl, her killing intent is totally exposed and easily read. The fact that the only magic she can use is imitation magic, on top of her being weak, gives her the slightest chance of defeating him. While choking her, Rawl states that he could easily kill her right at that instant. However, he claims that he is kind to those who seek revenge. That's why Rawl gives her a choice. This made Theodora confused as hell. Rawl then shows her a key to the vault where the treasures that Allingham hoarded are stored. The riches there are plentiful enough for her to make a fresh start in life, along with the enslaved demons. That said, Rawl is giving her a chance to accept the offer and leave with the demons. Or will she stick to her goal of exacting revenge, which will obviously just lead her to die in vain? Now it's just a matter of time before we know which one tickles her fancy. The reaction that Theodora makes reminds Rawl of his past self. The uncertainty in her eyes is so evident that Rawl has decided to tell her that having a big sum of money will give the enslaved demons another chance in life. Since no matter what angle they look at it, even if the demons are freed from slavery, they won't be able to get anywhere in life with their current financial state. Rawl tries to help Theodora in making a logical and practical decision. Rawl also wondered what happened to the Ada girl that Theodora had impersonated. Rawl asks if she's killed her in order to impersonate her to exact her revenge. With a teary eye, Theodora states that Otto was the one that saved her. The day after the box containing Charles' remains was found in front of the door, Otto's mother immediately arranged for the funeral. Because of her daughters, she didn't tell anyone how her husband had died. One week later, her mother told Otto about how their father died at the cost of trying to free the demons from slavery. Otto cried her eyes out after hearing the shocking truth. Her mother then informs her that the demon her father had successfully saved is currently at a healer's house. Since their father has failed to deliver the truth to the capital, Ada's mother wants to fulfill her husband's last will. That's why she wants Ada to come with her to the capital and tell everyone about what happened. But since Mr. Allingham is probably watching their family's actions, her mother suggests that she use the magic of transformation and check the said demon. When Ada got to the healer's house, Theodora was seen resting in her bed full of bandages. The healer then informs Theodora about Ada, being the daughter of the man that saved her. But instead of saying thank you, Theodora shouts at her, saying not to step any closer. However, no matter how hard Theodora tries to sway Ada away, Ada keeps on visiting her every day. Ada keeps on asking her for her name, calling her Lady Demon most of the time. It reached a point where Theodora was so annoyed that she accidentally told Ada her name, which is Theodoru. But Ada ended up hearing it as Theodora. 
hence why she is now called Theodora. The relationship has grown stronger each time Ada visits. At this point, Theodora has already learned about what happened to Ada's father. That's why when she says she's sorry, Ada just hugs her, saying thank you. Since that moment, the distance between them has shortened dramatically. After that, they started talking about what had happened before and what they had to do next. Months later, the day of them finally traveling to the capital with the help of Wendell has come. Theodora and Ada were so excited. As Theodora steps out of the healer's home after months, she is so thankful to Ada for her being by her side throughout the whole time. As she sees how happy Ada looks, she promises to make sure to protect Ada's smile no matter what. On the way to the capital, it will take them half a day to reach the cabin in the forest. However, Ada assures them that once they get there, they will definitely be safe. Along the way, they come across some of Allingham's men. The two had tried to be as discreet as possible. However, Theodora thought that if they took a detour, it'd take them until nighttime to reach the cabin. And as we all know, traveling in the dark is far more dangerous. That's why Theodora suggests she'll act as a decoy. During that opening, Ada will use her imitation magic to reach the forest cabin first. However, Ada is quick to disagree with Theodora's plan. After all, her duty is to bring Theodora to the royal capital, and she can't possibly afford to let anything bad happen to her. Theodora then assures her that she'll be okay since she'll use her imitation magic herself and transform into an animal and regroup with Ada after a while. Ada then tells her that she should not worry so much about regrouping. As Ada wonders whether her father got flustered because of promising to return back home for her, Theodora then tells her that that wasn't the case at all. At that point, Theodora finally noticed the deep injuries that Ada had gone through. After all, Otto was still a little girl who had also lost a loved one just like her. However, Otto would always maintain a smile for her. That's why Theodora thought it must be her turn now. That's why instead of promising to come back, Theodora just tells Otto to take good care of each other's lives. With that said, they parted ways. As Theodora tried to shake off the bad guys, Otto went her way to the cabin. When Otto arrives, she's welcomed by Wendell. However, as she enters the cabin, there's a shocked look on her face. When Theodora finally arrives as well, she herself is shocked to see Wendell together with Mr. Allingham. As she enters the cabin the moment the two leaves, Theodora cannot explain the emotion she is feeling at this time. She sees Ada together with her mother and little sister all dead on the floor. At that point, Theodora has promised to take on Ada's place and avenge the innocent involved in Mr. Allingham and Wendell's crimes. Going back to the present, Rawl is quite fascinated by Theodora's story. The victim's exact revenge for her savior is so heartwarming. However, Rawl has no time to waste anymore since he is off to his next destination. That's why Theodora must make a decision now. Even though it'll stomp on her pride, Theodora decided to take the key for the sake of her people. That said, Rawl bids her farewell and thanks Theodora for exacting his revenge. Two months later, a trial involving the dependent Christiana Alcott commenced. That's all we have for today. Don't forget to subscribe so you'll be notified if you upload part 7 of the series. Until next time, bye! With a big smile on his face, Rawl greets the Royal Highness, the King. He then informs the King that he has already dealt with everyone, from the imposter hero to Allingham and Wendell. However, it seems like the King wants to know all the details too. Rawl then did as the king asked. The king is amazed at the pleasing methods Rawl used during the murders. Rawl, who is proud of his actions, even wishes he could send footage of the incident directly to the king's brain so that he will be able to witness all the acts himself. The king also quickly asks what happened to the demons captured. With a big smile on his face, Rawl reveals that he incinerated all of them along with the facility. Although he has no intention of killing anyone apart from the people he wants to get revenge on, he just thinks that it might be a problem if the demons were to lead a rebellion in the future, considering Rawl is the one that killed the ruler of the demons. His decision is commended by the king, saying it was an excellent choice. After all, the demons are brutes no different from monsters. The king isn't afraid to spill such insults since he knows that the demon king is already dead, so there isn't anybody to be afraid of. In between their conversation, the king also remembered something. While Rawl is away, some delightful thing takes place inside the castle. This statement made Rawl curious. To make it even better, this said delightful incident involves the saintess, Christiana Alcott. However, it seems like Rawl already knows about the said incident. The saintess was subjected to a trial, and the news about it spread like wildfire. It is said that the saintess's use of her magic on the princess during the central plaza incident was discovered, and she is currently imprisoned. Since then, the citizens have been bringing the same complaints against her. Many claims, mostly men, that she is a witch. Due to the mountains of complaints about her, Christiana's trial began sooner than initially scheduled, and the closing argument will take place tomorrow. However, the king was able to think of a peaceful method to hear what the saintess had to say. He made her take down the high-grade monsters in the most delightful way possible. This made the king think that holy magic is truly troublesome in a way. Rawl then agrees with the king, stating that holy magic is indeed a strong power that would be able to kill him easily. This made the king wonder if there was any reason for them to kill Rawl. Rawl then honestly stated that there is a long list of that, like getting revenge for Victoria. However, the king was immediately enraged after hearing his imbecile daughter's name. As the king gets weaker and weaker, Rawl decides to take his leave and visit Christiana instead. The king, on the other hand, seems to realize that Rawl already has plans to exact his revenge on the saintess, considering he got back just before the trial. 
However, the king assures that there will be no issue since even if Rawl has plans, he will not be able to interfere with the trial. The king thinks that turning Rawl into a pawn will be useful. When Rawl arrives at the dungeon, he is not shocked to see the saintess satisfying herself in front of prison guards. It seems like Rawl has already gotten used to the dirty nature of the saintess. She is like an animal in heat, isn't she? As the guards feast on her body, the saintess seems to enjoy the pain and pleasure all at the same time. She even instructs the guards where her pleasure spot is. She begs them to make her feel even better by penetrating her heart. The guards then decided to open the gates as their little friends couldn't take it anymore. But before they can even pleasure themselves, Rawl is quick to disrupt them from their enjoyment. It seems like the guards are still amateurs to fall for the saintess' blatant seductions. The guards immediately flee due to fear that Rawl will punish them. Christiana then reasoned only to Rawl that the guards made her obey to do such nasty things. However, Rawl is already quite aware that it was the other way around. Christiana even attempts to seduce Rawl, but it seems like Rawl is not that easy to be tumbled. Rawl then uses his magic to cover the saintess's naked body with a jute bag. He then quickly states that he is aware of the fact that Christiana has cast holy magic on everyone and removed the hoops binding their lust. Since the beginning, the saintess has been pleasantly whispering into everyone's ears, whispering their reasoning and exposing their inner desires like what she did with Wendell, the general, and the princess. Rawl knows that this is the way the saintess has been offering her salvation. Hearing this made the saintess smile, as the fact that Rawl had kept silent all this time really amazed her. Rawl then tells her to atone for her sins as the sentence of her trial is about to be made the next day. But instead of listening to Rawl, she states that she has always atoned her sins, together with everyone, to the afterlife. Christiana is rather carefree, knowing she would be Rawl's next target. It seems like she's even excited to finally know what kind of revenge Rawl will take on her. Rawl then states that he has been thinking up extensively for their date, so he hopes the saintess will look forward to it. The next day, as the saintess trial commences, so was Rawl's seventh chapter revenge. Everyone is gathered, looking, anticipating the verdict. Compared to others who have gone through such trials, Christiana is rather calm and cheerful. The trial begins when the first witness, which is Christiana's aunt, comes forward to the chair. Her aunt bluntly states that Christiana is a fearsome child. She added that Christiana brainwashed her parents and drove them to commit suicide and declared that she did so for the salvation of their souls. While her parents burn themselves to ashes, Christiana just watches them meet their death while she giggles with happiness. Christiana doesn't have the heart of a human. That's why people now have been calling her a witch, since that better suits her identity. Then the second witness, who's a soldier, enters the scene stating that Christiana seduced his comrades. She would go around gazing at the men, pulling them out while she shook her hips. The said soldier secretly watched the bizarre scene that unfolded that day. His comrades, who swarm around Christiana, suddenly begin killing each other like maniacs while she still enjoys pleasuring herself using the soldier's dead bodies. The soldier then explains that the reason why he couldn't denounce her at that time is that he feared for his life, knowing that Christiana is of high status. Then a third witness enters the chair, this time as a priest. He states that Christiana is a devil wrapped inside a human's body, as she's the devil that overthrew an entire country. Christiana tempted an innocent woman who is a fiancé of a prince of a country. After hearing the whispers of the saintess, the innocent woman has turned depraved and mad. She then conceived a child whose father was unknown. This made the prince angry. As a result, the prince ended up killing the entire royal family and then afterward killing himself. Now with the loss of the royal family, the entire populace gradually left the country. However, instead of atoning for her sins, the saintess reasons that her acts as a saint were all done for the salvation of the people. Her statements make Rawl amazed. Then, a lawyer for the saintess tries to rebut all the testimonies that the witnesses made, stating that the saintess has nothing to do with the deaths of the people they have mentioned. All that the saintess did was talk. After all, the actual people involved in the case are already dead, so outsiders like the witnesses can't simply supplement the trial. But when Christiana's team thought they'd already won, Rawl jumped right into the scene serving as the fourth witness. He's quite excited to finally torment the saintess who's not afraid of death herself. But Rawl is quite sure that the scheme he has up ahead, the saintess will surely scream not with pleasure, but by pain. After taking his oath, Rawl immediately informs everyone what kind of person the saintess really is. On the outside, she seems gentle and pure. She behaved like a saintess and was popular with everyone. However, behind the scenes, she just preyed on people like the soldiers whom she healed using her holy magic. Christiana then expresses that she never thought Rawl would be so lowly, returning for the sake of exacting revenge on her. Christiana truly believes that her godly whispers to the princess that later on ended up killing the old Rawl was Rawl's salvation. The saint states her disappointment at the fact that Rawl left heaven just to exact his revenge. However, Rawl states that he came back from no heaven but was instead reborn from the depths of hell. While they are chit-chatting, the saint's lawyer has grown bored. The lawyer keeps on insisting that the saintess has proven her innocence since the medical examinations on the dead victims show no signs of magic scars. Rawl then asks what was the crime Christiana got arrested for. The lawyer then responded it was all due to the assumptions that the saintess had supposedly cast holy magic on the princess. In that case, Rawl suggested that they should just ask the princess herself if the assumptions were true or not. This statement made the lawyer somewhat confused since everyone knows that Rawl killed the princess himself in the most gaudy way possible. That's why there is no way possible that Rawl can get testimony from the dead. Rawl then states, what if the princess weren't dead? This made everyone silent. 
Now that the lawyer couldn't think of any rebuttal, Raul lets the princess, who is nailed to a cross, join the trial. Everyone is so shocked to see the disgusting and sickening state of the princess. However, the shock on the lawyer's face is indescribable, seeing that even in such a state, the princess is still bloody alive. Despite her miraculous survival, the court couldn't possibly be able to get any evidence of her in her current state. That's why the only way to know the truth is through physical examination. However, the saintist lawyer shows no worries, as he knows that the examiner will work in his favor considering he paid the old man a good amount of cash. As the examiner analyzes the princess's body, Mr. Lawyer is shocked by the old man's report. According to the examiner, the saintist's magic scars have been detected all over the princess's body, indicating that the assumptions were true, making the saintist guilty. This obviously made the lawyer angry, and to make it even worse for him, the examiner admitted his crimes of falsifying the evidence in the previous trials. Hearing this made everyone think of the lawyer's credibility. With this much humiliation, the lawyer insisted that Roll might have been controlling the examiner with his magic. As a result, a number of examiners are asked to analyze the old man, checking if the lawyer's claims are true. However, each of them gives the same result, stating that Roll didn't control the examiner with his magic. This made the lawyer go through a breakdown which amazed Roll. Now that the examiner has proven to not have been controlled, he expresses his desire to correct the results of the autopsies he performed prior to the princess's arrival. He states that all of the corpses he examined had magic scars from the saintist on them. At this point, the saintist's crimes are already evident, and Christiana's lawyer can't seem to accept the fact that he failed to win the case. He begs for the saintist to speak and defend herself. However, the saintist uses her godly whispers on the lawyer instead, making the lawyer go insane. As everyone watches the lawyer do stupid things, everyone is speechless when he jumps off the castle's glass window, diving to his death. That said, since everyone has already seen the true power of the saintist, indicating all the claims against her are true, the court has finalized their verdict. Based on the trial, the court has determined that Christiana Alcott is a witch, which means she is sentenced to be burned at the stake. A few days later, at the Kingdom Central Square, everyone gathered to witness the saintist's execution. However, it seems like the saintist doesn't even fear her own death. She even smiles at everyone while assuring them that they don't need to worry since she will now atone for everyone's sins with her death. As she gets nailed to the cross, the saintist shows a face of pleasure rather than a pain. She even asks to burn her more since the fire scorching her body is absolutely lovely. Everyone is shocked but at the same time frightened by the way the saintist acts. Even though she's being burnt alive, she stays bloody delighted. Until the end, the saintist died in pleasure. However, this was only the beginning of the show for Rawl. Rawl then takes the cross into his revenge museum. While he is arranging his trophies, a surprise attack catches him off guard. An arrow pierced his chest, which Theodora shot herself. Theodora can't seem to believe that she could defeat Rawl this quickly. The powerful dark magic has deteriorated Rawl's body, so Theodora has figured out that he'd be weakening against the light magic, but she never imagined it would be this serious. It seems like Theodora hasn't given up on exacting revenge on Rawl. Theodora says that she never will. Ever since the day Rawl marched into the royal castle and took away everything from her, Theodora has always been dreaming of her big sister, which is like torture to her. It turns out that the Demon King has died protecting Theodora. That's why Theodora really aims to kill Rawl no matter what. Rawl then challenges her to do it right now. Theodora then ties him up, saying that she wants to kill Rawl the same way Princess Victoria did in his past life. Theodora then gets her stiletto blessed with light magic, similar to the arrow she just used earlier. As she's about to stab him to his death, it seems like Theodora is starting to have second thoughts, as she remembers the time that Rawl helps her free the demon slaves. However, the pain inside her overflows to the point that she is able to stab Rawl to his death and watches him until his last breath. Five days later, as Rawl's body slowly rots, Theodora can't explain why, but even after exacting her revenge on Rawl, she still doesn't feel the same way as she did back then. In fact, she's feeling even more in pain now. Meanwhile, Rawl is back in the White World, now for the third time. The Goddess of Love then welcomes him once again. The Goddess looks so worried, but Rawl assures her that he is fine. In fact, she looks like she's in much more pain than he is. It turns out that after she fulfilled Rawl's request to be resurrected, her left arm was sacrificed as compensation. Since in the realm of the gods, everyone should act according to the laws. This made Rawl wonder who makes these set laws. The goddess of love then states that each law in the realm is determined during the deity assemblies held by the gods. But that's not what Rawl is aiming for. He then asks the goddess to grant him one more favor, which the goddess willingly does. As compensation to the gods, the goddess removes one of her eyeballs. She then summons a carriage that will take Rawl to the Gate of Judgment, where he will meet with Christiana. At the said gates, everyone is judged by their sins which determines their spirit's final destination. There are three of them, the Land of the Gods, Reincarnation, and Hell. It is determined by converting every person's karma and character while they are still alive to a numerical value. Around 90% are reincarnated and the rest go to hell, and only a few percent of souls are able to reach the land of the gods. It is also said that after a spirit passes the gates of hell, it will never see the light of heaven for all of eternity. However, despite knowing this, Rawl decides to go to hell no matter what. All of the preparations he has made until now will allow him to enter hell in no sweat. And for those who are wondering why he would do such a thing, it's just simple. He wants to exact his revenge even if it means he'll need to go to hell himself. 
Since for all, it is for the sake of revenge. He couldn't care less whether his light is taken from him. What's important to him is the conclusion of his revenge. As he reaches the gate of judgment, he immediately sees Christiana. The saintist is shocked to see Rawl in such a place. Rawl then reasons that he died for the sake of fulfilling his promise of taking her on a date. Christiana, being the perverted girl that she is, immediately hops on the carriage, excited to reach the place Rawl has arranged their date in. As they reach the gates of hell, Rawl immediately informs the saintist that this is the place their date is about to take place. The saintist is quick to decline Rawl's plans, stating that a being like her shouldn't enter such a place where heinous people go. The saintist keeps on believing that God is waiting for her in the realm of the gods, so she must hurry in an instant. Rawl then tells her that all he wants is to verify whether the saintist's so-called faith and salvation are genuine. The saintist just keeps on smiling, insisting that her salvation is indeed true, and that's why she cannot possibly go to hell. Rawl then makes a wager to convince the saintist to enter the tormented place. Rawl states that the people Christiana have indulged in pleasure to provide salvation should be enjoying a life of happiness in the realm of the gods. That's why to check whether the saintist's claims of saving everyone are true, Rawl asks her to join him in checking hell themselves. If they have ascended to the realm of the gods, it means that the saintess wins, and she will be granted a wish Rawl must fulfill. With such an offer, the saintess couldn't possibly say no. She even already starts thinking of things she wants to do with Rawl. When they got inside, Rawl was amazed to see how daunting hell looked, just like what he had imagined it to be. When they arrive at the place where the execution ground for lustful people takes place, Rawl remembers to look for someone he knows that has been a victim of the saintess godly whisper. During their preparation for the demon king's subjugation, Rawl had other mercenaries other than Wendell. For the first months of the training, all of his men were motivated to help and protect the innocent. However, when the time came that the saintess joined the hero's party, everyone seemed to lose their will and become unmotivated all of a sudden. One by one, Rawl's mercenaries leave the party, all due to the saintess's lustful godly whispers. Now that they have reached the place of execution where people who indulge in lust fall to, the saintess is in disbelief as she sees one of the men she supposedly saved through salvation getting punished for his sins. But instead of admitting that it was her fault that this man is seen being tormented in such a place, the saintess acts like a fool, like she wasn't one of the reasons for the man's suffering. She even told Rawl that she didn't know what the man had done, but it seemed to be that he was just one of those miserable people who were not granted salvation after committing so many sins. But, inside Rawl's head, this man is thrown to hell, all because of the saintess's doings. The saintess then asks why he would think that it was all her fault. Rawl then tells her to look at their faces closely. However, the saintess probably can't remember any of them since she only did it with them once. That's why to help the saintess remember for herself, Rawl lends her his magic. In the memory that Rawl has shown the saintess, it is seen that different men are feasting on her body while she screams in pleasure. Everyone desires the saintess, without her doing anything. The saintess keeps on saying that as long as these men feast on her, they will definitely reach the realm of the gods, but it seems like they feel they are in heaven already. On the other hand, the saintess in the present doesn't admit to her doings even after seeing the said memory, claiming that the men in hell are not the same as those she had pleasured on earth. That's why Rawl makes her look at the men's faces once more. As she looks closely, she finally realizes that Rawl was right all along. The saintess's face is undescribable as she remained frozen in disbelief. When she snaps out of her thoughts, she then states that it's cowardly of Rawl to show her a fake scene claiming that Rawl is trying his best to beat her even if he goes as far as doing something like this. However, Rawl used her statement against her when he stated that the moment she asserted that the whole thing was fake, it meant that she had some memory of the said events. Otherwise, she wouldn't be able to know whether the scene was real or fake. The saintess then reports that the men's faces look familiar to her, but they are not the same people that banged her before. She then added that if they really were the same people, she had nothing to do with their sins since what happened to them was from lust. Instead, it is for salvation considering she is the one chosen by the Lord. The saintess keeps on fooling herself into believing that the pleasure she gives are for salvation, not for her own sexual desires. Even though she already witnessed the said men getting punished for their sins in hell, she still keeps on believing that they are all in the realm of God, enjoying life in heaven. Rawl then smirks as he tries to internalize how foolish and crazy the saintess is for pretending not to see them even though they are already right before her eyes. It seems her head has quite some damage, huh? Oh well. She's been like this for the past episode. Everyone at this point must know she's a crow crow. Well, whether or not she believes Rawl doesn't matter, since she has already noticed that unease has already sprouted through the inside of her heart. However, the saintess keeps on denying such accusations stating that no matter what happens, her faith in salvation shall never waver. Hearing this made Rawl even laugh in disbelief. Seeing that no matter how hard he tries to make the saintess come to her senses, the saintess keeps on sticking to what she believes. Rawl has decided to take her to the next execution ground. On their way there, Rawl is looking forward to hearing what the saintess is about to say about what she sees this time. As they pass through the execution ground for sloth, gluttony, wrath, envy, and pride, they finally reach the execution ground for greed. The saintess can't deny the fact that the execution ground for greed is extremely hotter than the others. It is said that the ones who arrive at the said ground apparently cross the burning bridge, go through torture, and then fall into the pond of blood. As two people pass through the said bridge, the saintess goes speechless as she sees two familiar faces. She keeps on telling herself that these people are just mere imposters. These two people are none other than the saintess's parents. She tries convincing herself that her eyes are deceiving her. After all, all this time, she thought that her father and mother were in the realm of the gods. 
She can't explain her emotions as she sees her parents get thrown into the boiling blood, killing them slowly till their skin melts, only to find themselves in the same agony again as no one can die in hell. When her parents see her, they are shocked, the same as the saintess. The saintess couldn't speak properly as she was well aware of the fact that because of her doings, her parents were now rotting endlessly in hell. It is said that even though her parents did as she commanded, killing any person who got in the way of her faith, they only found themselves paying for their sins instead of living a happy life in the realm of the gods. When her parents are about to go through another round of torment, she rushes to them in hopes that she is able to catch them on time. At this point, she starts to question herself on why her parents are in such a place even though she has given them salvation. Rawl, on the other hand, with a wide grin on his face, states that there is only one answer to the saintess's question, and that is, all of the things that are happening to her loved ones are the true outcome of her so-called salvation. The saintess's parents couldn't hide their frustration anymore, saying how dare their daughter trick them into believing that she'll give them a life full of happiness, and yet they found themselves in such a horrible place. While the saintess is struggling to digest everything, Rawl then asks her why she isn't saving them with her holy power. The saintess now has gone insane as she still continues to tell herself that the people in front of her are just mere imposters. Realizing that the saintess still doesn't atone for her sins, Rawl now has moved on to his next plan. He shows the saintess an image of a woman. The saintess is quick to ask who's the said woman in Rawl's hands. Rawl then states that the woman before her eyes is her master, the goddess of love. Hearing this made the saintess speechless and in disbelief, since the saintess doesn't know much about the deity. Rawl then does her a favor by introducing her to the goddess of love. He also explained that the master the saintess is looking up to does everything he asks and is even willing to do everything for him. Rawl even shared the time that the goddess immediately exchanged her right eye to procure the carriage they used to reach hell. Hearing all this made the saintess furious, saying that everything Rawl was saying must be a lie, considering there is no way possible the goddess who bestowed the saintess her powers would do such a thing. She continued by saying that she is the goddess's disciple, and that's why she has given salvation to countless people with her holy magic in adherence to her master's orders. Therefore, the holy goddess could not possibly be such an unsightly woman. The saintess's statements never disappoint to amaze Rawl. Now that she is currently in deep rage with everything that Rawl has been doing, the saintess is about to use her holy magic on him, only to find out that it doesn't work. It turns out that no one can use any holy magic in hell, that even the goddess herself is scared of entering the eerie place. Hearing this made the saintess state that it is cunning of Rawl to wait for her to make the first move. Rawl is then quick to respond that he has double checked on whether the saintess can use holy magic or not. But since she has called the goddess an unsightly woman, she has already made a bad record of herself. Besides, if she can't use her holy magic, she is no longer the one chosen as the saintess, but instead, she now remains an ordinary human. This shocked the hell out of the saintess. Not knowing what she'll do next, she stayed and stoned as if her whole life had shattered for good. Rawl then tells her he has already taken her place and enacts his revenge plan. As her life decisions start to flood right in, the saintess couldn't contain her roller coaster emotions, feeling as if everything she is going through right now will be the end of her. Knowing that she doesn't have any power whatsoever to fight Rawl back in any way, it'll be just a matter of time before we know what fate has intended for her. Seeing how the saintess has been acting, Rawl then asks her what she is doing, not saving all these people before her eyes. Rawl then tells her to save them again with her body, the same exact way she always does before. Now that she is the one getting feasted on not by pleasure but by pure pain, the saintess screams for help as her agonies continue. One after another, her victims try to call her name again and again. She screams for them to stay away and not touch her, but none of them do so. Then, to make it worse for her, Rawl also informs her that it has already been decided that she'll go to hell since the beginning, ever since she passed hell's gates. It's appropriate after all. She has corrupted many people all for the name of salvation, so it is just fair enough if she shares the same agony with them. Hearing all of this doesn't convince the saintess in any shape or form. She screams for help once more as she tries to get away from everybody. Hearing her scream made Rawl think what can he do. Since he expected much from the goddess, Rawl revealed to the saintess that the goddess had prepared something for her. The goddess chain is a chain that will save anyone who climbs it, including those who are already dead. Knowing this, the saintess immediately climbs her way up, not thinking of the people behind her. Even if others fall, she doesn't care a bit since she wants to be the only one saved. Seeing this made Rawl laugh and asked her, doesn't she give people salvation? The saintess then states that she couldn't care less about salvation at this point. This means that she is already admitting she is not the saintess anymore, to which she immediately agrees. For her, as long as she is saved, she doesn't care about the others in hell who supposedly need her help. However, when the saintess is almost at the top, Rawl himself cuts the chain off, stating that the saintess should just drop dead and melt in hell. As the saintess falls into the boiling pool of blood, she couldn't explain her emotions any longer. However, her punishment is the payment for her sins since she has discarded her faith. As her body melts, she screams in pain, only to find herself going through the same thing again and again. She couldn't believe that she was experiencing such a thing, knowing she was of holy power just a few moments ago. On the other hand, Rawl is fascinated by the way the saintess looks, as her dead appearance really suits her. At this point, the saintess already notices that there is nothing special about her. That's because she has been manipulating people with her holy magic when she too was being manipulated in the end. She couldn't control her body like she used to, 
As she walks down the path that the sinners go, Rol has finally concluded their hell date and bid the saintess farewell. The saintess cries, begging Rol not to abandon her. But Rol couldn't do anything himself, considering a woman who wallowed in pleasure on earth is now wallowing in a pool of blood in hell, which just shows that karma does exist. Now that his revenge is already at its end, Rol rides his carriage once more as he is now on the way to Hell's Gates, going to start his revenge on his next target. However, when he got there, the gates had no sign of opening up, just like what the goddess had said to him. Then, the goddess herself enters the scene, making Rol smile as he thinks that the goddess was freely able to come to him. The goddess then reminds him once more that he cannot leave Hell no matter what he does, since that is the rule that the god who governs Hell has established. And throughout history, no one has been capable of breaking that rule. However, it seems like Rol thinks otherwise. It is said that the one who governs hell is the cruelest and merciless among gods and terribly despises humans. Naturally, he would never lend an ear to what a human has to say. In this case, all that Rol must do is get the god of hell to listen to what he has to say. Rol then asks the goddess how he would be able to kill the said god, but it seems like the goddess firmly believes there is no way Rol would be able to defeat such god. Rol, now sick of the lukewarm debates with the goddess, furiously asks her to hurry up and tell him already since he must return to the surface again now to purge more targets for his revenge and anyone who stands in his path, even if they are a god, will be eradicated. Now irritated by the goddess's continued claims that he couldn't possibly win over the hell god, Rol snatches her heart out. He then sees a memory of the eternity that the goddess has lived through. There, he hears the gods talking ill of him. That's why using the said memory, he starts looking for a weapon he could use to kill the gods, which he eventually does find. It is called the god-killing sickle, a weapon that many thought didn't exist but turned out to be true. It is a weapon to overturn all laws. The said weapon is located at the treasure repository in heaven, Rol found out. The goddess immediately tried to warn him that he mustn't do whatever he was planning. Since the said weapon is a ritual item that gods must protect at all costs, that's why Rol then asks her what she can do to allow him to obtain the god-killing sickle. Rol then states his demise for the gods, stating that throughout the time he was struggling, none of the gods tried to help him even though the gods were the ones who made him humankind's savior. In the end, after being harshly exploited, he was forsaken. Therefore, he too is going to exploit and forsake them all harshly. However, he states that for him, the goddess is an exception as he tries to use her once more. However, since the goddess is in the worst state at the moment, Rol decided to visit the hell god for himself. However, as he reaches the exact place he left the carriage, he is shocked to see that is nowhere to be found. Considering it was the goddess's power, when she became weak, the carriage disappeared. However, a group of creatures with wings shows up and tells Rol that they will take him to the hell god. It turns out that these creatures are fallen angels who have been working for the said god since the beginning. On their way there, these fallen angels don't take care of Rol as much, carrying him in the most uncomfortable way possible. That's why Rol threatens to kill them if they don't treat him well. He orders them to hold him comfortably and he promises he will not resist. At first the fallen angels seem reluctant to even agree with Rol's request, considering he is just a mere human being in hell. However, in the end, since the fallen angels are also scared of how the hell god will react if they are late with their delivery, they eventually give up and do as Rol said. When they got to the god's castle, Rol wasn't amazed by how it looked. As they finally reached the grounds, the fallen angels used the magical powers of a cane to open the gates. This made Rol think that the said item must be a divine one. As the gates open, Rol and the fallen angels immediately went their way in. Inside, Rol is yet again not impressed with the castle's aesthetics and ambiance. He even thought of decorating it with the trophies he has now in his revenge museum. When they were almost at the god's room, everyone heard the god of hell getting furious for waiting too long. Inside Rol's mind, the god shouldn't have made such a long hallway. As they are about to enter the god of hell's room, Rol feels a similar feeling when he enters the gates of hell. As he finally entered the room, Rol said his thanks to the hell god for his honorable invitation. There, the demon king then asks his servants to announce Rol's offense. However, instead of taking everything seriously, Rol acted disrespectfully at the hell god, stating that they should just jump right into the conversation. The hell god, on the other hand, has also prepared something for Rol. So before they start with their conversation, the hell god gathered Rol's most favorite deceased to entertain them. The hell god wants to use these said people to make Rol suffer. However, it seems like there is no sign of Rol being worried about the worst case scenario. The saintess is the first to beg for the hell god's help. As she kneels down, asking for the hell god's mercy, the hell god immediately answers the saintess's prayers. It saved her in the most unexpected way. As the hell god reaches out its hand to the saintess, stating that he'll allow her to be free now, everyone is shocked. The saintess is so happy that she can't contain her tears any longer. As she's about to say her thank you, her whole body hardens and turns into stone. When the hell god grasps her body, it immediately shatters into pieces. The hell god then states to Rol that if he is hoping that the people he personally took revenge on will suffer endlessly in hell, he's mistaken. As of this very moment, the hell god will do their best to free everyone from their suffering so that Rol will suffer as well. Hearing this, the people that Rol has taken revenge on immediately rush toward the hell god in hopes that they would be next, as they aim to make their suffering end. However, we all know that Rol wouldn't allow any of his toys to be taken. That's why when the hell god almost freed one of Rol's victims, Rol immediately rushes towards them and snatches the man away from the opportunity to experience any sense of freedom.